Right. So welcome everyone to Tartaria Australia. We have got a super interesting, fascinating show today. So I'm going to welcome all of our guests, starting with Campbell, the co-host. Um, and we are welcoming the amazing, very revered Evan and Stephen Strong today. They have been um, very influential in my understandings of history and obviously coming from Australia. So thank you for joining us today. I think this may actually be... Um, an, an unprecedented conversation to actually have live. So thank you so much. And Lee, thank you for organizing this. You you have your own amazing work going on. I've been yep. tuning into your, your clips recently. So everyone welcome. Do you want to introduce yourselves in any capacity, say anything? Otherwise, I'm just going to hit you with some uh, straight into a conversation. Uh, let's go straight into it. Yeah, uh, jump into no, it. Maybe <laughs> us talking about ourselves. We don't really like doing that. Let's just talk about things you want to talk about. We're happy to go there. Great. Well, I'm like, first of all, I thought I would just um, get Campbell maybe to introduce a summary or together we'll introduce a summary of the premise of what Tartaria is okay. and um, and then just sort of like start talking from there. So do you want to intro it a bit, Campbell? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Tartaria uh, is basically a country that was, um, it's been omitted from the history books. So this that's why this whole sort of niche is called Tartaria. Uh, is because, yeah, we've come across all these maps and all these um, references and books talking about Tartaria. And, of course, we called it, uh, told it was just a region um, where the Tartars lived, but we've, you know, we found king's list, we've got flags, we've got navy flags. So it was a real country uh, and we've got all the maps and it was basically wiped out. You see the maps and it, but at one point it was quite large and it just sort of gets smaller and smaller and then disappears um, around the sort of early 1800s. And of course, you know, we've never been taught about it, right? It's been literally wiped from the history books. So that's sort of uh, the first thing that, that um, you know, the first topic. The second topic that sort of comes along with it is what's known as the mud flood. And again, it's just a term, you know, we're not sure exactly what it is, but it's the phenomenon of um, sunken buildings that we see all over the earth. Uh, they're everywhere. And they basically have windows that, go into the ground you only see half a window popping up and they have stairs going up to the front door yeah. so it's like the building is you've, you've got half a level sunk so you've got to walk up to the level above and the, there's half a level below and of course then we've discovered you know underground tunnels and you know there's there's a whole world underground pretty much at the moment and that led into the architecture uh you know and which is that we're going to touch on today with australia is in Australia, we have all these amazing old old world buildings built in the 1800s, and they are basically exactly the same as buildings we find in Europe, Africa, Asia, the USA, everywhere. They're all the same. You know, all the capital buildings are all the same. Um, you know, they all have similar features, you know, the domes, the columns, um, the porticos, all this kind of stuff. And then uh, another, I guess, major topic would be star forts. Uh, which is, have you heard of star forts? <laughs> have you looked? So, so star forts are, again, they're everywhere. And um, they call them bastion forts as well. So the story is that they were built as defensive forts by the Italians and French uh, around the 1500s to the early 1700s. And uh, they sort of say they built, you know, maybe 100 or so, but We've now found these star forts everywhere. They're in Australia, they're in the USA, Africa, um, and like we've literally tracked more than five thousand of them on Google Earth. They're everywhere, and it's and it's it's part of a system. It, like they, then we've just it sort of we've discovered that these star forts they're not you know they're not really forts, but these stars and they're called stars because they're literally all state shaped like stars. Um, they can be five-sided, six-sided, seven-sided, or pointed. Um, and they're all attached to, to cities, walled, big walled cities. And when you look into it, you find these cities are, the, are the, all the major cities, Paris, London, every, every major city has a star fort in it and was what we're calling star, was a star city, which is basically a city attached to a star fort. Um, so that we've basically uncovered, just looking into this, this whole underlaying of a culture and a civilization that, that was clearly across the whole earth, clearly was building the same kind of technology, the same infrastructure, and it's, it, we've got remnants of it, but we're not told anything about it. 
all we've got is just this this physical evidence everywhere and we're pretty much trying to piece it all together what what is going on but clearly what we know is you know his story is not our story right his story is written by the winners so it's all been uh changed and we're just yeah trying to rediscover what's been hidden and I should, that was great, Campbell. And I should also add Australia's of particular interest because we obviously have this history we've been told that is literally um, take the Indigenous history out of it. But our, the white man is 200 years old, roughly speaking. And um, the Tatarian history counteracts that because the buildings that we have here, I'm in Melbourne, all throughout Melbourne are classically Tatarian. And um, basically, if you go through the history um, society, reference points on say like the exhibition center here in melbourne it was built in one year with um before the um the invention of electricity light bulbs and power tools and today we can't mimic this sort of architecture so what that says to us is that literally melbourne was here before we were and the cities that make up flinders street station parliament um state library I mean, countless, countless buildings just here in Melbourne City. You know the ones. So they are really ornate, beautiful. They all have massive, giant doorways, huge columns, giant arched windows, towers, steeples, bells, um, beautiful facades that we do not mimic today in any concept. In fact, our architecture today is like ridiculous comparatively. So even today we couldn't build it. So basically that would then lead to the concept that 200 years ago Melbourne, Melbourne wasn't founded it was found dead. Literally, it was found and dug out of the mud, which then I would like to bring into the dialogue with you guys of if that is the case, then are there any reference points at all in all of your understandings with the Indigenous knowledge that there were actually city structures here in Australia before our his we landed in Australia? Have, and plus, I will add one more premise, which is all of this is built by giants. Like these are literally built, we are literally living on the tops of buildings that are huge, huge doorways, huge windows, huge archways. They're giant architectural structures that do not fit the size of, of we, us today. So all that's right. the premise. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, in answer to your question, I, I can't say that what we found in the past has got the label you've got, but we have found things in the past that don't fit. That's basically what we've been doing. In relation to our dreaming stories and um, evidence of earlier civilizations, the answer to that indirectly is no, none. But that's in, I'm sorry, that's, that's the direct answer. The indirect answer is not that clear. And let me explain why. I think Evan knows where we're going to start this, don't you? Yeah. I, yeah. Um, yep. All right. So <laughs> when we go to uh, Sydney and um, when the first fleet came in, it's not well known, but it is known in universities too, there were three paintings done of Pinchgut Island, which is an island in the middle of Sydney where they put a fort in later. And those paintings, and we've seen them, mm. have a 90-metre obelisk that was on top of that particular island. So, look, I'm not saying something that we've made up. This is actually paintings and drawings we've seen by the accredited state or country artists that were chosen by the authorities to depict Australia. And to begin with, you've got to remember, before photographs, all our information is through paintings. Mm. So it's fascinating how we take a lot of the paintings and say, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. But the three we know of that were done of the uh, obelisks are basically never discussed. Mm -hmm. So, yes, they're there. Were there earlier civilizations in Australia? Absolutely. That's really not even debatable. We do know a story, and we we'll have to be careful about this one. Yes. Yeah, you know what I'm going to talk about, yeah. don't you? <laughs> we know the story of a group of people, we won't say who because it will give up who they are, that worked with archaeologists throughout Australia for quite some time, and they take a whole group in, they'll take in everything, portable toilets, tents, tents, the whole thing, and they will do all the grunt work for the archaeologists while they go on to country. Now, we know this because we met the guy that runs the whole thing, but we're not going to give his name up because he gave us information that relates to what you're talking about. And he actually came to us 
out of frustration and anger about the fact he'd been on in the country with archaeologists, I'm, I'm afraid they weren't telling the whole truth. And why he came to us is because time after time he had been in the middle. On one occasion, they found the remains of an ancient civilization, and he still got the photographs of them. And the whole day they were looking at this stuff. It's somewhere in the desert, and it's just bits and pieces, but it shouldn't be anywhere. And at the end of the day, they sat around the, the campfire and they got the archaeologist drunk first. <laughs> because it's kind of like they're going to get the truth out yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they brought it up and said, okay, what are we going to do about this? And they said, nothing. Absolutely nothing. We are not going to follow this through. There's nothing we're going to do about this. We've seen this stuff before. It is not on our radar and you will not be talking about it because you've got to remember this is why I'm doing this. This, this organisation is funded by the federal government, right? So I don't want to get them into troubles, but I can talk in secondhand information, what I've been told. Now, these guys are the real deal. Mm. They work with all the universities, don't they, mate? Yeah. And they, they are the ones, if you want to go inland and you've got no money, they'll do the whole thing for free because they're sponsored by the federal government. I won't say why or how because it gets too close to the quick. He was so frustrated and he knew that we'd found a skull that doesn't belong anywhere and he actually wanted to go there so they went to the federal government and they went to a university of which we won't name and it was set up it was going to happen they were going in there to find this skull it's not a hominid not a homo sapien doesn't come from here and then a professor stepped in the day before and the whole thing was called off so yes we know of the fact there were ancient civilizations now i can't give you a label to that I can only give you a presence because obviously at this stage um, I haven't seen the photographs and <laughs> after what happened, because he said he was going to find out why we got blocked to see that skull and he was going to fix it up. And he rung me up once, didn't he? Yep. He was onto it. He was going to fix it up and he'd get back to me soon. About a year and a half ago, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> of course he couldn't get back to us because he's funded. So, look, all mm. credit to that gentleman because he was trying to do the right thing, but, but got rolled. So, yes, now here's the trick with this. Why is it that the original people of today do not have stories about these, this particular civilization, th these buildings, and <clears throat> all the artifacts we've got? Now, the artifacts we've got, the rocks we've got, cannot be identified at any, legion, any area in Australia. Because the technology and archaeology, uh, sorry, the technology and the markings, the, the temperatures used, which go into thousands and thousands of degrees, the cuts that were done with the finest blades possible do not belong to stick, stone and bone technology. Now, what you need to understand that Australia is unlike other civilizations, we believe around about 10 to 12,000 years ago. There was the decision made by the original people to walk away from the technology that was rife and rampant through the whole of Australia. Whether that's linked into Lemuria or whether it's linked into Tartaria, I can't say. All we deal with is the end results. But, um, I mean, we're doing a show, I think, not next week, the week after, and it's solely based on the rocks. Now, the rocks have been seen by the Australian Museum they then threatened to take me to court, didn't they? Oh, mind you, I've been threatened to go to court now by the Australian government so many times now. It's more than with one, one hand. And they know those rocks do not fit in. Mm -hmm. Have we found artefacts in Australia that do not belong to stick, stone and um, bone technology? More than we can count. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere. I mean, had a, we had a phone call yesterday, didn't we, Evan? Yes. Another rock. Hmm. a stunning piece of work, and all the lines are perfectly, perfectly geometrically shaped, shaped so that they're perfectly straight, 180 degrees, no deviation, no kink. I've got one rock that has about 150 lines, and every line on it is perfectly straight. Now, original people don't do geom geometry and straight line and precisions like that in their art in anything now. Did they in the past? Yes. 
was there technology in this country that is at least the equal of the best of what we have today? Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. I've got one rock there, uh, which we're going to talk about further on, that has a perfect map of Australia Borealis, which is interesting because you can't see it, can you? No, you can't see it by, by the eye. You uh, can only see it through a telescope. Yeah, Dr Derek Cunningham from England saw the markings and said that's exactly the same as Corona Borealis, which is in the Northern Hemisphere, and it's exactly the same markings. Now, the point is that you can't see that star system unless you've got a telescope, but this rock is five, 10,000 years old. Another rock we've got, we know, because of where it was found, is at least 15,000 years old, and you would be flat out today doing what they did on that rock. So, yes, the government knows about this because they've written to us on, I think, five different occasions. Uh, I think it's about five. Five formal letters threatening to put me in jail and probably are close to 100 emails reminding me that they're going to put me in jail. And late last year they sent me a letter, didn't they, Evan? They, uh, was it last year or year before? No, it was just before Christmas anyway. Right, yeah, and it was called a letter, what is it, notice of warning, wasn't it? Yeah where they said they have enough information to put me in jail and lock me up for three years and fine me $1 million. They've said that every time. But they have decided they will not take me to court, but they then reserve the right at any time in the future to take me back to court depending on how I behave. So why would I get these letters? Because all of the things we found do not fit into the embrace of any stick, stone and bone technology, but they are tens of thousands, thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of years old. So the solution is in everything we do, I mean, we have, I've had, you haven't got one, have you? No. No, I've had my Anasio agent since 2015 and I know a professor rang him once and asked him about what he was going to do with me and he said, simple, Put him in jail and lock away the key or throw the key away. That's their job. Now, I haven't done anything against the law, Mm. nothing, nothing whatsoever, but that doesn't change the fact they want to put me in jail and lock away the key. Now, I've got some skulls at the moment, which, um, well, I've actually got part of it here. I'll show it to you now. Here's a part of the makeup for the skull. Mm. Can you see the forehead? Mm. There isn't one. Mm. Now, this skull has a 1,800 cc, um, it, ours is 1,300, it's 500 cc greater. It has massive eyes, but it has no foreign. See how far that, that's the straight way the face is. Now, we've got it made up as a complete skull. That's been done too. And when that was done, that's when I got a letter from the government saying they're not going to put me taken to court anymore because if they did, I'd walk in with this and say, this is what I found, but they won't let us tell the world. <clears throat> so what they've done is I've got an official letter from them. And what it tells me is this, I'm allowed to keep these bones in our house. But if I take them out the front door, I go to jail. If they're analysed or tested, I go to jail. So, yes, we have a lot of different evidence that tells us in Australia and a long, long time ago, there was something going on in this country that doesn't fit anything of today. So therefore, if you're looking for information about, say, those rocks, there was one elder, wasn't it, Kano? Yeah. He knew the story of the rock, and he told me that dreaming story. To my knowledge, that's the only original person I've met in this country ever that knows anything about the archaeology we have today. So it's a long answer, but the answer is no, There are no stories about that, but you've got to remember that the stories that we're hearing today from the original people come from a technology that's been thrown away where they're basically naked sadhus that in in, in Tasmania, they even gave up the knowledge of making fires. Well, for God's sake, mate, they are no longer interested in technology. They're walking away from all of it. They saw it as a gift and a burden, and the burden was too great. Mm. So, no, there is not stories, but evidence everywhere. That, that is so interesting, Cam. I'm sure you have so much to say there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, 
but like the idea that there was a timeline where they actually decided to walk away because from the Tartarian timeline, this was like the highest advanced, technologically advanced civilization, but unified and working with high frequency, high sound somatic frequency technology. But there was an alternative, um, I, I guess I'm going to say force cam, but you probably have another word for it that was pushing up against that. And um, interesting with the Tartarian architecture, I'll just mention this, is that everything's built out of red brick. And it looks to us that Australia has been desolated at some point. Um, the whole of the inland of Australia is red desert. Now it's really interesting that because from the Tartarian consciousness perspective, the earth is flat. So that's number one. Um, we're on, you know, we're not talking interdimensionally here or, or different versions of the energetics of that, but the plane is flat with a firmament. And that firmament holds um, a flat earth, so to speak. So land masses are essentially a lot of our land masses are either a melted civilizations that have taken such a heat blast that they've melted into potentially something that would look like as rock or um, shattered or cut down trees, giant trees that would look like a mountainous plateau mm. or the sharded plateaus of say um, the Himalayas. Um, and then you've got quarrying going on, which is digging out these um, canyon like and what we would now know as our ocean, the bottom of our ocean landscapes, which has created this, concept of mountains, hills, canyons, oceans. Now, from that perspective, um, Australia has had an event take place and it, we are now have this red desert and this sense of this red is exactly the same red as the brick. So whether or not there was an event in Australia, what I'm saying in summary, a long time ago, before where we're coming in, which is like 1800s, like long time ago, that decimated what was here? So, Campbell, go for it. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> Gosh, you know, I've got all my questions. That, <laughs> that is interesting that you say they walked away from technology. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, I could almost envis envisage that happening in, in the next five or ten years again. Yeah. Because you know, yeah. look what they've done to it, right? Uh, but but that, a big part of, yeah, the architecture that we look at looks like it was, you know, the, these buildings weren't necessarily you know, buildings, uh, the, we look at them more as machines, uh, like free mm -hmm. energy machines. They all have the big domes that are made of copper. They have big spires going up. You know, we know that there's free energy the higher you go up. Um, they're all basic, you know, grounded. You find all these strips going down. It's got a lot to do with geometry, um, you know, all this stuff. But it looks like it was integrated and, and sort of beneficial to mankind. But at some but sometime... Um, at least a couple of hundred years ago, something's happened. Um, we don't know, you know, what happened to the centre of Australia, but it's the same as what you see in the Middle East around Sodom and Gomorrah. You see it all across the Sahara. And the Sahara is, of course, it's like, a, like the, the whole Sahara is full of old cities and castles that are just smashed. Mm -hmm. So it looks like, yeah, some big events going on. And whether that's like a plasma event from the sky, like a natural sort of plasma you know, uh, discharge that, that's gone on or whether it's something more like a Jew weapon, you know, um, like a, an actual attack, we're not sure. But but what it looks like is there was a society running and something's happened and either we've been attacked and lost or it's been natural and someone's, you know, the people that rule us now that are keeping all, this, all the secrets, they've just come in and sort of taken over. And here we find ourselves and we don't sort of know where we are, who we are. Uh, you know, what our past or history is. And, and of course, like you say, the government are, are willfully hiding this, you know, and, and we know that, you know, that fraternity, right? Those, I probably don't know, can I say it? Yeah. Uh, those free people who like masonry, the free Freemasons. Yeah. Um, we, we say that they're called that because they came to all these cities, right? And what did they find? Free masonry, free buildings, yeah. and they took it all. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because when you were doing that, both Evan and I were thinking of one site, weren't we? We were, yeah. It's the same site, and I'm, I probably need to explain. I'll give you the very, very vaguest of details about where it is. It's not far from Sydney. You, you might have seen a bit in the um, 
TikTok video that that Leah put out. Oh yeah. Um, Which one? Yeah. <laughs> there were so many of them, uh, but yeah, there was it was featured in one of those. Oh, yeah, it's um, called Butterbox, and and the, oh, yeah. the trick with Butterbox was we were invited to that site because we don't go on to country unless we're asked by someone, normally an elder. In fact, always an elder. And with Butterbox, um, it's not like any other site you'll find in Australia. Number one, when we went there. The first, and I asked original people about this site and they said they wouldn't go there. I was taken by a white fella. It's about the only time we had been, isn't it? Yeah. Because no black fella goes near it. It's death country. And when we got there, there was a couple of things we noticed that really stood out. Number one, no birds, no animals. And this is the scary part. No insects, were there? Mm, I couldn't find an ant. I couldn't find a fly. I could. And whenever we go on country, we always have bird sign. It's like obligatory. It's like the spirits are welcoming us. And when we got to this particular site, um, it was just, it was not like any site I've been to. There was no life there. And we had three women, didn't we, Evan? We'll yep. talk about the three women too, won't we? Yep. Anyway, so we went to this site for the day and we picked up gutters where you could sit inside them, an old man from mm-hmm. Sandstone. What was interesting, the place we went to has got the softest sandstone there is. You can pick up the rocks there. And you can crumble them in your hand to individual grains with no effort. It's called type four sandstone because type one is like granite and everyone thinks sandstone's the same. Well, I'm sorry, you're just wrong. (laughs) This stuff is rubbish, but amongst it, we were finding gutters that you could sit inside. We were finding domes. We were finding a a structure that was about 30 metres high was broken to sections, wasn't it? Yeah. And we spent the day looking at this site and it was really obvious the way it was, and we've even found um, stone pipes mm. with melted slag caught inside the stone sandstone pipes. Yeah, I thought this is this is amazing. They're melting things here. This is something that's quite advanced, but it was destroyed. And of course, people would say, "Well, how can you prove that?" Number one, because all these things were scattered over about five k's, weren't they? Yeah, all over the place, and everything was smashed up. But the main reason I knew there was something wrong with the site is that night the three women that were involved in this all ended up in hospital with exactly the same symptoms. Bleeding, wasn't it? Yeah, they were coughing up blood. Coughing up blood, all three of the women. They went there this morning fine, bouncing around, and by that night they went to different, I think two went to one hospital and the other person went to a different hospital, didn't even know each other. And we found out the next day they were all still in hospital in quite serious conditions, and they finally recovered. Now, I would say to you, the chances of one person being sick at, at the site is quite okay. Two is quite rare, and as a, a saying about third time proves it, if three different women, we only had three women there, if they're all in hospital the next day and they're all bleeding and they're coughing up blood, that's the site. The site, and that's why the original people wouldn't go there, and that's why the birds and the animals and the insects wouldn't go there. And to be honest, we haven't gone back, have we? No, we haven't. <laughs> I, I would like to go back with like a EMF reader, a uh, Geiger counter, mm-hmm. Geiger counter, mm-hmm. all, that, all the gadgets yeah. just to see what happens. Yeah, but I knew at the start when I got there and I couldn't see an animal there, I thought this is not a good site. I knew the elders told me we're not going there. Good luck, but that was the remains of that place was blown up as simple as that it was blown up and we did the research on it because some people would say oh it's the remnants of buildings from the first settlers we did a lot of research on this this place was discovered by the catholic walking club wasn't it yeah that's right in about 1940 no one had been there before there for god's sake no one had even got there in fact, there's a, built, uh, a mountain near there, and I'm not going to say which one because it gives away the location, where if people, when they climbed it, put their, uh, put it on a piece of paper and put it in a bottle to say they'd been there. And the earliest date was 1936. So nobody went there. And some people could say it's an abandoned building. Man, it's on the top, in the Blue Mountains, on the very top where you can see in every direction and you couldn't grow a thing in that soil. Yeah. It's just pure grains of um, sandstone. So that's a place that was fully blown up and destroyed. 
And what's fascinating is whatever was done to it, that energy is still there. Mm. It hasn't gone. So I don't know what they did to it, but I can tell you something, whatever, however they blew it up, they did a bloody good job on it because <laughs> nothing can live there. No animals live there and no people should go there. And to be honest, it's a dangerous place to go. And if you were a woman, you wouldn't go there. Gosh, it's imagine good. imagine if it was actually um, tech that had been trapped underground, underground, still in some of the structure and actually still functioning on some level and emitting yeah, a very been toxic to a site like that too. frequency. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we've been, we've been to a site, site like that, that also. Yeah. All, all the trees... Grow um, to a certain point and, and then collapse. fall down, and all and around, one... and it's like a, a, a rectangle of bush. And what happened was, one of our people, his name was um, Ryan, wasn't it? Mm. Ryan Mullins was going through because we had some um, some a map from Klaus Duna to take us to different sites from a more ancient civilization, which he said was fifteen k's by five across, and it was all buildings there. And we got about 150 hits. And the five we went to, we got amazing sights on every occasion. But Andy went to this site and he got there and he's walking through the bush and all of a sudden you just go into a complete rectangle. It's like someone cut it out and you've got trees on top of trees on top of trees. You can't walk on the ground. You can't get near there because there's so many dead trees on top. But those same trees, if you go past into any of the four corners, everything's perfect. Everything's perfect. But what was interesting with um, Ryan was because he was on his own and didn't do ceremony, he nearly died there. He collapsed while he was there and crawled out of the site. When he got out of the site, he started to come good, okay? And, he, and basically what we then did is we went back as a group and I gave ceremony to the site and we tried to work out what the hell was going on. Our understanding is there's something underneath that site that's still functioning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what Klaus was telling us too, because we got back to Klaus about this, Klaus Duna. He's done a lot of work around the world on this sort of stuff. And he said, take a mask next time and make sure it's complete. Don't let any of that air in because he feels that side is still, whatever's happened to it, whatever energy or what's been placed underneath, is still functioning. There is not one fern, not one anything that can grow on that site and if it does, you can see a couple of trees that have started to grow and already <laughs> they've got a use by date. You can see they're just dying as they grow. It's so, dying. yes, uh, is there evidence? Absolutely. I'm not prepared to say where it comes from. Um, it may be what you're talking about is right. The same way I'm not prepared to say yes or no to flat earth because I don't hold an opinion either way on that. Okay, that's not for us. We've got enough. Battles to fight without <laughs> fighting yeah. others, to be honest. Yeah. We keep away from other people's um, crusades. We've yeah, got enough yeah, yeah. Own. But what I can tell you is there is uh, copious amounts of evidence that we found and measured and we've charted that proves to us there were far more advanced civilizations in Australia and for reasons we don't understand and we've been to one place that gives us a clue your idea of them being destroyed, certainly something like that's happened in Australia because we do know the remains of that desert place. They told us then it had been destroyed. <coughs> the place we went to had been smashed. And that other place I spoke about would be about 40, 50 k's from the one that's uh, been blown up with the gutters. So it's not just one site on its own. They're all over the place. And you're right. I have no doubt authorities further up the pecking order know of these sites, mm -hmm. absolutely know of them, and are doing everything they can to make sure that they never do get known. Was yeah, that... well, I, I mean, the people still in power would be the descendants of those who, who you know, conquered or, you know, the land in the first place, wouldn't they, really? Yeah. So they're, they're, hiding, they're keeping the secret to keep the power. Oh, absolutely. Um, we do know, for example, that um, one of the people we're working with, Nina Angelo, bailed up, um, who was it, Julia Gillard, oh, didn't she? Yes. And she made out that she'd be interested in this, and I don't know, it may well have been the case, and she may have been actually quite pure about this, but it never came to anything. But we do know that this is known of at the highest levels of both state and federal government. And, I mean, I, as I said, it's 2015, isn't it? I've had him for five years, haven't I? Yeah, yes. Yeah, I've had my agent for five years now. I never know what he looks like, and I know where he lives. And if you're watching today, how are you, mate? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, I mean, it's a fascinating um, conversation because, okay, so if we look at uh, the idea of some of the land masses in our desert, and we've got some really interesting ones there. I mean, most people perceive Australia as because it's like flat plain, but in actual fact, there's so many canyons and so many ridges, but obviously like known to the whole world is the, the Olga's and Ayers Rock. Now, in what you've sort of like, through your research, would there be a fair premise involved that um, there is a vast underground remaining um, structure under something like Ayers Rock? Uh, no, I don't think it's under Ayers Rock, to be honest, but I have is there are there underground structures? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we know of one. Um, and we do know it's guarded, don't we, Evan? Yes. In fact, we know a person who was going to go into that cave where the rumour was there was an underground crystal city. Yeah. I'm not going to be too specific. Uh, I think, and I think one of our elders talked about a city of steeples. City, that's right, a city of steeples, yeah. Well, we actually steeples. know where the entrance is, and it's guarded by a farmer. And I can tell you a story about a real estate agent who told us what happened. He actually went up to this farmer and said, I want to go up through that. Um, uh, he, he came to look at his property, right, and he said he wanted to sell it. Um, but then he said, I've heard about that, um, that cave up the top and I'd like to go and have a look. He said, you can't go there. He said, why not? He said, because you're not allowed to go there. He said, but that's not on your land. He said, yeah, but you've got to get through my land to get to it. And he said, well... I'm going to go and have a look. He said, no, you're not. And he said, well, what's going to stop me? He said, me, I'll shoot you and I'll kill you. And he stopped and looked at him. He said, what are you talking about? He said, I've been given permission. If anyone goes up there, I've been given permission. I'll shoot you and kill you. And don't you worry about it because I'll come and clean it up. And no one will know where you've been. Now, our elders have told us about this site. We've been told that there's beings that run in and out from there all the time. And we know, we know exactly where that site is. And it's part of a series of tunnels that run at least 80 k's. And I have been told by one elder, it runs from where we are, which is near Byron Bay, to Sydney mm. in a continuous tunnel. Now, I can't prove that, but I have been told that. But I can tell you one thing, the story about this guy with the gun, and he said, I've shot people and killed them and they've been cleared up. That came to me from a real estate agent who's quite well known in the area, isn't he? Mm. And they all think he's a bit wild and a bit crazy. But, um, yeah, that particular, we've known about that for quite some time. I've actually been, I went to that site 25 years before. Um, and that's what started me in archaeology. It's in the same place. And I stumbled upon some things then. They shouldn't have been there, and I'm not allowed to talk about them. And that's what started us on this occasion because we knew that what I was looking at, that's not original. In fact, even a, a lady called Josephine um, Isabel McBride, mm -hmm. that's right, she discovered part of it, and it was a track, a road, not a track, a road, and I've seen it. And it's got gutters and it's got a camber and it's about two metres across, and I walked over an aqueduct. By the way, original people don't build aqueducts. Um, and I walked to the main part of this and we found a brush box tree that was growing on top of that track. And the brush box tree was 8.4 metres in girth. And according to the, um, the loggers there, that makes it 600 years old. So it wasn't made by Europeans. This is on the side of a 45 degree sloped hill. And it was built to go into this cave from another angle where people lived. Mm. And when uh, a bulldozer fell over the top of it and went through into the cave in 1962, they called it Gracie's Temple. Now, blackfellas, whitefellas, when they fall into a blackfellas cave, even if it's religious, they don't call it a temple. And they said it went forever inland. And it was found then. And McBride went across to look at it because they found it. And she did say in her report, there was nothing like this in Australia. I don't understand what it is. I rung her and asked for permission to go and pick the site up and continue with it and got that permission. Um, and we found it, it, it runs through the whole of the side of the mountain. Mm -hmm. It's on a, a level that's scary to walk on, for God's sake, let alone build a, a road on, but it's there. 
We also know there's a cave in there, don't we, Evan? We do. And we nearly got to that one too. So, look, in Australia. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. In Australia, um, the evidence of anomalies is absolutely massive. Mm -hmm. But what tends to happen, unless you want to risk being threatened um, with all sorts of things, is you just don't say anything. You let it go. If you're an archaeologist, they told them on the night, there's an unwritten law. When we find this stuff, we forget it when we leave the site mm. and we don't go back, and that's what we're going to do. That's why these guys come to see us. They couldn't do Anyway, they couldn't change it anyway. So, yeah, what it belongs to, who owns it, that's debatable. But it's there. That's yeah. not debatable. I mean, when we look at all the Freemate, the concept of the Freemasons, their whole thing was architecture and buildings. Their whole thing was to do uh, that the clue was in the buildings, in the architecture. And like when we start to look at Australia's architecture and then pitch it to our 200 inverted comma year history of the white man narrative, like it completely blows the story out of the water. Like there is so much evidence against it. So that leads me. To the next trippy part of this premise, which was um, around about 200, 300 years ago, we had this event, this, this current event, and there's been a few, but this current event, which is termed, as you know, the mud flood, which basically um, crossed the whole plane and buried everything. And then we start to see these pictures, these photographs of all of the all of our most renowned cities of the world like you know london rome like every major hub and they have huge mudded um streets huge mud they're all built up like the scene behind me and there's no people zero people and this is around 1800 no people no people no people now someone was there taking these photographs but apart from the person taking the photo or the thing that was taking the photograph could have been a drone for all we know <laughs> like literally um there's no photos and then yeah. suddenly in like a 20 to 30 years after that that all these people start to repopulate these city centers and so that and then we get these stories of the convict the convicts arriving convicts. and populating australia that narrative makes zero sense we get this whole narrative about orphan trains orphans. where hundreds of thousands of children were basically exported around the world who apparently had no parents and then we have we have this freemasonry freemason um you know spread across the whole world as if they were the micro managers the managers of this process so from the Tartarian perspective, all images we have of all of these buildings being built are all very vague images with all the skies are always white, nothing in the skies, like they've been deleted somehow. But they're all, they're, they've got scaffolding around them, but it's all the deconstruction from the top down. So it looks like they're just always going, deconstructing all the towers, all the technology, all the bells, and all the bells got confiscated across the realm in like uh, between World War I and World II. Yep. So all the bells removed from all the towers. So that's part of the technology. So what this, if we look at Australia specifically, it means mm. that in about 200 years ago, humanity was reset and was actually manually repopulated and redistributed across the plane. And then with that, and then our history was told to us, we got, we were programmed into this narrative that like, this is what our history is. Somewhere in there, a thousand years of time was added to our history timeline that's false. Yeah. Yep. And mm. then we've got this sense in there that then they're all timed with the world trade fairs, which are these interesting massive events that were happening all over the plane. Basically, we didn't even have power or light bulbs at this point. And these huge trade fairs and interest in how tying it into Australia, then all these native cultures were rolled out as part of yeah, these yeah. trade fairs introduced to the new population at the same time they had baby incubators at these trade fairs introducing babies to the population and then on top of all of that we have these huge magnificent structures that like a week after the trade fair they always burn down and there's a total demolition yeah, I knew that. Yeah. of mm, the mm. that area and the history books say they're all just built out of plaster Mm. Like, <laughs> um, but some are still standing. <laughs> but then we've got to look at the question of, okay, if our history is completely falsified and we've been completely reset and reprogrammed, 
then what is our Indigenous history alongside that? Because there's going to be a section of our Indigenous history that had exactly the same experience. They were mm. redistributed, repopulated, reprogrammed with their version of the narrative as the contrasting story to ours. But then alongside that is the third area, which is there were an original people that seemed to escape this whole reset reprogramming modality and somehow lived still in alignment with, you know, light source, unified nature, our original people. So any thoughts on any of that? <laughs> that, that was a, like a <laughs> big summary. Massive play. I mean, we do have the stolen generation, of and course. And the stolen well. generation, of course, and massive reprogramming there. Uh, look, I, I can't, I, I, I'm not going to say you're right or wrong about what happened in other places. I can only restrict myself yeah. to what happened in Australia. And my suggestion would be if that did happen, you've got to remember the original people have already made a decision not to be part of this. Yeah. So my understanding is we what we have in Australia is continuous. That's why we're finding bones that are go back. I mean, like the ones I've got, that one I just showed you, we know for a fact that's got to be 60,000 years old because that where it was buried was on a, a ridge that would have overlooked the Murray River when it was there before the Cadell Fault moved at two kilometres, and that was 60,000 years ago. But there's a burial site there that would have been facing the river. So we believe that what took place in Australia has nothing to do with the rest of the world. I think Australia is separate in a lot of different respects. It was the last continent to be stolen back. America was the second last, and they left us alone. You've got to remember the Egyptians were in Australia for 4,200 years. The Phoenicians were here. The Spanish were here. All different beings have been here at different times and have stayed for a while and left and been asked to leave on each occasion. <clears throat> when the British came, they were asked to leave too, but they wouldn't go. Every other group did. We know the Egyptians were here until 400 years ago, and I have an elder who told me when they left, why they were thrown out and why they were told not to come back. So... What happens before then, I don't know. But in Australia, that was their story out there. Ours is different. Yes, there were earlier civilizations here. Yes, a lot of it was blown up and exploded. That's definite. But the mechanics of that was a long time ago. And in Australia, we weren't part of the rest of the world until they came to us in the 1800s, basically, before that. We weren't part of anything. So what they were doing out there wasn't our story. So, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. And I've, I've, I'm, I've got a friend of ours we work with a lot for a long time. His name is Shane Curl. And I can tell you that everything you've said, mm. he said it, hasn't he? Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm fully behind all the stuff you're talking about. And, look, I, I don't, for the flat earth thing, I don't really gel with that. But what I've learned to do is unless I know something is true, Everything's yeah. possible. And the very Absolutely. few things I know about are the fact that I've got original skulls, we've got original artifacts, and they're ancient. And they tell me that at some stage in this, this, this place, they adopted everything that we have today and walked away from it. I know they did that. Mm. And I know why they did that. And in the rest of the world, they did what they did. And we deliberately made sure nobody came here. People say, yeah. oh, we didn't travel out. We traveled out to everywhere. But no one was allowed to come in. I mean, the Egyptians came for a while and then they were banned. They were the only group that had a period of tenure here. Are we allowed to time. ask why they were banned? Yes, I do. I do know why. Well, I didn't ask. I was told by Wallen Gary, who's a famous regional um, culture man that still lives in Sydney, doesn't he? I think so, yes. Yeah. Wallen Gary told me what happened. See, they started. Um, there's a story up in Carrion where they first came, and that was 4,600 years ago when Kufa was in control and two of his sons came in and they had a concord on agreement where they could come to Australia and be tutored in the spiritual and mystical and magical realms. We didn't do the other stuff. We walked away from it and that was fine. They were allowed to stay. They were welcomed. They could do their lifestyle and do their farming if they wanted. We didn't interfere with that. But 400 years ago, a group of Egyptians came to Australia and um, they stopped, their, their boat stopped at Balmoral Beach in Sydney. I was told that by the elder. 
And if you go to Sydney from Egypt, you go inland. That's where you go. And they went into the middle. I can't say where, but when they went into the middle, they stole four of the sacred rocks I've been talking about that we had. Now, I don't know if you understand how much original people regard these rocks, mate. That's just like breaking into the Sistine Chapel and stealing the artefacts. So the warriors tracked them all the way back to Sydney, followed them all the way there. And when they got to the beach, they speared and killed all of them. And they told the Egyptians in the boat, you've broken the Concord, you've broken the Makarati, you've broken the treaty. You are no longer welcome. You can never come back to this country. So the Egyptians left 400 years ago or whatever the date is because of, you could be yeah. give or take on that. And soon after, the British came and we told them to leave and they wouldn't. Because when the British came, they brought 11 ships and they were basically full of, not convicts, soldiers with guns. You've got to get this straight. Everyone thinks, oh, the, the, first co- the, the first fleet was full of convicts. Crap. Yeah, yep. crap. There, yeah. Were, there was an army there. They knew what they were coming to. Cook knew when he when he actually uh, put the flag up. He wasn't allowed to. And the, in the flag, it said they were there. They knew they were there. And when they came, they raised the flag. And the, uh, actually, instructions, I've read them, said you're not supposed to until you get approval. And they never did. When they came, <coughs> they knew there were people here. And they knew they had to take it off. And they knew it was a war. Mm-hmm. Now, I've read reports. And that war... What people don't know, the Windley lost the war in 1796. Pemel, we had taken Parramatta and Toon Gabby and burnt it to the ground. He'd actually attacked them the day before with a brilliant guerrilla attack. What had happened was the troopers had been out for six weeks looking for Pemel, because the whole of Australia was scared shitless of Pemel. And what had happened was that... Um, Pemel, we could speak the language in three weeks, and he was actually taken to Philip. And he was asked to eat a dine with him at the morning teas for the first four years until he realised that this was a con. They declared war on the British in 1792. And in 1796, half the, the, half the garrison was um, based in Parramatta and half was ga- based in Sydney. And they'd been out for three weeks trying to find Pemwy and found no one. But he knew what they were like. And what had happened is the day before, all the warriors, because... Toon Gabby and Parramatta were basically two large streets. And what they'd done is the nights before they buried themselves into the sides of those streets out in the bush and had stayed there for a night and waited for Pemelwy. And when the troopers come in in the afternoon, he knew what they did. They always went straight for the rum. And as they were dismounting, he started to walk down the main street with two spears in his hand. He stood about six foot four and he's a crow coat. And a lot of people saw him. And when they saw him, the troopers were fully armed. They screamed and ran away. But he had two guys. There were two guys there. One was called Patterson or somebody, and also the Surgeon General. Pemel, we picked up, picked up his two spears, threw one at the Surgeon General and killed him outright and killed Patterson outright. He was the only one trooper there that he fe- feared. Well, the rest panicked, and then they picked up their guns and tried to shoot him. What then happened was all of the original people were on two sides of the street and they just started throwing uh, spears over the houses into the road. And the story is, and this is from the official records, within two minutes of the garrison of 150, 43 were mortally wounded and they retreated. They couldn't fight them. They couldn't see them. They started shooting each other. They were shooting each other because it was in dusk. They couldn't see the black fellas except Pemwe just stood there and you shoot at him, but you can't kill him. They just couldn't hit him. It was like Crazy Horse in America. He did the same thing. So what happened was they retreated to the um, uh, to the fort, but the fort was made of wood. So what Pemwe and, and the the, the um, his warriors did is they burnt down all the houses. They basically, basically burnt Toon Gabby and Parramatta down to the ground. And then the warriors said, let's burn down the fort. Well, what had happened is one trooper had left and raced back to Sydney. Sydney was in a state of chaos. They were racing towards the beaches to get on the boats. They weren't going to fight. They were too scared of him because there had been a lot of things that happened before, and they thought he was unkillable. So what happened was they surrounded the fort, and this is a report that was put up by Eric Wilmont, who is the, um, I think it's the Chancellor of James Cook University, isn't it? First black fella to do that. He's the one who wrote the book called 
Pema with a rainbow warrior. And this is all based on the what took place. Then what happened was Pema, we, they had an argument between the warriors because the warriors wanted to burn down Parramatta, then march on Sydney and kill them all. Pema, we wouldn't do it. And he told them why. He said, they kill our women and children in that fort are women and children. Our fight is with the men. We cannot do this. And he told all the warriors to leave. And then what he did was he stood in front of the fort and he waited there until it was until the sun came up and they stuck their head above and they could see him. Then they ducked down again and they'd look up again and they ducked down. And finally, they could see it was him. So they shot him and they shot him and they shot him. And they reckon they shot for about five minutes before he fell. <coughs> well, they changed everything. He got to Sydney that he'd been fallen and everyone was cheering and everyone was happy and they put him on a cart and they drove him down there. And they drove him into Sydney. Philip had a look at him and the Surgeon General, because they had one left, the other one was dead now, looked at him and said, his lung is full of blood, he will die. I said, great, fantastic, because if Pamela is dead, we can now win the war. By the way, it was a war. This is what I've got to make the point. It was a proper war. So what happened was, and no one could work out why Pemmel had done this, but couldn't work out why he stood there and waited to be shot. But he had a plan. His plan was brilliant. Then what happened was, Cook, uh, sorry, Philip decided, we'll lock him up and we'll put him in the jail and then I'll get Nagel, who's his cousin, to come and have a look at him and see him in the jail and see he's about to die and tell the rest. So the war's over. Good thinking, he thought. <laughs> so Nagel went and saw him. He's laying there. And he's laid on a, uh, a table with manacles on his arms, on his legs, and on his neck. And I remember I read where the report was, why are you doing this? Philip said, I don't trust him. I know he's about to die, but I don't trust him. Well, what happened was after Nagel left, a song started, and it went on all day and all night for the sec next six days and nights full stop. And everyone in Sydney was going crazy because they couldn't sleep. It just never stopped. They were singing him back. And then what happened on the seventh night, the song stopped. So in the morning, Philip went in, because the Surgeon General had been in three times and said, I don't know why he's still alive. He had about 20 bullets in him and his, his lungs was punctured. He said, I don't understand why he's alive, but he's going to die any minute. So they went in there, two guys out the front. They opened the door. He's gone. One crow feather laying on the table, turned around to the troopers. What have you done? Nothing, nothing. He's gone. After that, it was well known that people were told not to go out at night because Pemulwe will get you. There were stories of people seeing Pemulwe two days later in Manly where there was 20 troopers there, all fully mounted. They turned and bolted away. They wouldn't even face him. And remember, Pemulwe's head was cut off in 1802 when he gave up. He stood in front of the troopers in 1802 out near Currajong somewhere. They bolted and then turned around. So he stood there and they inched back again and then they shot him and shot him and shot him. And he died this time because he didn't want to live. They cut his head off and the next day it was in a boat called the Speedy going back to England. Yeah. We've asked for that head. They won't give it back. Now, that if they did, if they gave it back, you would find that Australia was actually in war and on that particular battle, if Pemulwe had behaved like the British, the British would have been defeated in six, 1796 and there would have been no more British here. But Pemulwe would not drop himself down to the level of the people who had invaded his country. So, yes, there was a complete war there. In fact, Watkin Tench, who was second in command, wrote to the British time after time and said, declare this a war. We're fighting and losing. Remember, when the, the uh, attack took place in, um, I think, in Tasmania, something like 500 whitefellas were killed. And I think they killed about four original people during that time because the six tribes worked together. They couldn't beat them. They were going to evacuate from Tasmania. People don't know that in 1831, nobody went outside Hobart. They couldn't or Port Arthur. They were scared. They couldn't go anywhere because they owned nothing. It was like Iraq where when we were there, 
Mohammed Karzai could stay in Kabul, but nowhere else because nothing else was under their control. That's why they got Angus Robinson to go and tell all the Blackfellas, lay down your arms and we'll give you half of Tasmania. They gave him Bruni Island, didn't they? Yes, and sent them all off there and got Trug and Innie, tricked her in convincing them that it's safe to do that. They spent, I think it's 30, 1931, they had the Black Line where they'd sent out 500 men to bring back all the Blackfellas. Lock them all up and bring them back. And they went out there for five weeks. It cost them something like 15,000 pounds to do this. That's a lot of money today. And do you know what they came back with? An old man and a young boy. During that time, five of the men there had fallen off cliffs and died. So after five weeks, five of them died and they found two people. They couldn't catch them. And they thought, we're going to have to leave. We're going to have to leave Tasmania because we can't farm the land. And then a preacher came along and said, I'll sort this out. I'll tell them, I'll give them the promise then, I'll lie to them. And they came and they laid down there. So they, ladies and gentlemen, there were major wars in this country. And in two occasions, if the blackfellas had behaved like whitefellas, we would have lost Tasmania and Australia. But they had more dignity and they had morals and standards, even in warfare, about what you can and can't do. Fighting another man face to face, they're up for that. But harming a child or a woman, nobody would do that in warfare, would they? Oh, so no that's else. the real story of Australia. That's part of the story. So my point is this. Don't believe this government because they lied about what they said when they got here. They've lied about what they did when they got here. So why would you believe what they told you was here was true? Mm. Exactly. I mean, and yeah, the big thing, like Kel mentioned before with Australia is you know, if they turned up in 1788 and then they had wars and that, I mean, how long was it before they, you know, I mean, we've got buildings from the 1860s that are massive. So we're meant to believe that, you know, in 60 years, they've built all the industry to build a building. You know, they've got brick factories and glass factories and all this kind of stuff. Mm. And that's kind of where we come from is, is the story doesn't make sense. Like no, it said, doesn't because you've got to remember, do you know why Blacksland went with Lawson? Went across there with the original people. They, they went there for one reason, and it wasn't to find new land. Do you know why they did this? Because they were all the convicts were doing runners, weren't they? Yeah, Eddie? they're all taking off because they had a rumour. By the original people, the new people have been here before. There are major cities. There are major, major civilizations in the middle. And therefore, what was happening was, because there's no jail here, all the Irish were doing runners straight away. They just said, well, bugger it. We're going off there. And a lot of them died trying to find it. So what happened was Blackland, Wentworth and Lawson went across the Blue Mountains not to find farmland. That wasn't the main reason. It was to convince the convicts there was nowhere to run. Now, that is the truth. That is the main reason they went. And when they got there, they said, there's flat plains where you can run sheep. They said, oh, shit. Or go across now. But remember, Blacksland went with Lawson, couldn't got to get across the Blue Mountains, so I taken across by Blackfellas. Well, there was a rumour of an inland sea too. The inland sea, but remember, they were running to buildings. Yeah. Now, this is the beauty of this. Original people, and myself included, because I'm original, we are shocking with time. We tend to talk about the past as a future, and therefore they're telling this mob, what are you hanging around here for? You've got your spot in the middle. Go back there. And that, if you check the records, you will find that was said commonly. They were losing so many of the Irish particularly, because the Irish hate the English anyway, right? And they're all being chucked down here. Well, they were just doing runners straight away. A lot of them joined up. What was that guy that joined up with Pemmel? He was his name. Oh, big. It was a big giant guy, wasn't he? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Forget his name now. He led an insurrection there. They were told. You've got an inland city. What are you doing here? Why are you being treated like that? Leave these people because they hated them for whipping them. Go up there where you belong with your mob. So that's where they were going. And that was done to stop the exodus of free labour and slave labour. Luckily, they've got them back today. <laughs> We've got the slaves back. <laughs> we're not going to talk about that because we'll get banned. Oh, yeah, exactly. But that's the real history of this country. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you knew the real history of what was going on, 
you would know that that pinch gut thing was a, a massive monument, and that was done by original people, but not the mob from now, from way, way back. And, of course, all of this stuff is part of the real history of our country that has been stolen. And, of course, mm. the original people, the problem is that there are very few people, original people, and we know most that do know this stuff. There's still some that know it. But you've got to get to the highest level of initiation yeah. mm. to actually know this information. We know that way back Australia was broken up into three confederations, three confederations. And that meant if you were in that confederation from the Kimberley to Cape York, all the way along the coast, 300 miles inland, is called Southern Law Confederation. And everyone traded. Everyone went from one place to another. This was very fluid. There was one confederation in the middle and one up in the top in the north. And they were like a sort of sub-nations within an Australian place. So nobody really understands what happened in this country. But to say that there are earlier buildings here, yeah, we knew that. <laughs> that part you're talking about, I can tell you now, the evidence is it can, absolutely conclusive. And I've got to make the point, um, and I've got one here. I'm going to hold this one up. I'll hold up this particular ring, right, and I'm going to hold up that ring which comes from Angkor Wat and this piece that comes from Gosford, a piece of metal. Now, I'm going to tell you something about these two objects. They share one common factor, one common ingredient. We get the best science in the country. This particular piece of metal, which was found at Carrion, which is near Gosford, was analysed by Graham Lancaster, who is the head at Southern Cross University okay. of their laboratory there, mm. right? That particular piece of stuff has been analysed. They did this chemically. This one was done electronically. But what do they share? I can tell you, 24% of this object is made from material that is not on the periodic table and doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. This one, which is found in uh, Angkor Wat, which is not in Australia, to show that's everywhere, 41.8%. This was done electronically, wasn't recognised on this planet. So what we've got is two objects, one found here, and by the way, Two other rings were found in Australia at a place called Hill End. One was one metre beneath the surface and the other four metres beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. All, and one of those two rings, and I've got it with me now, but I'm not showing it to you right now, also has a component that's not from here. Yeah. So, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, if it's not on our periodic table, then what the hell is it? Yeah. It means that there's a technology going on there. And by the way, I've got to tell you something about this particular object. It's 73% aluminium and 3% copper. When they worked on this, and I'll hold up the cut. I don't know if you can see it or not. There's a cut yeah. on the edge there. When they worked on this, they got out the normal drill tip to work with aluminium. It just slid off. It didn't make a mark. They had to get to go to the hardest tip they had, and that's how they managed to shear a bit off to analyse. Now, I've got to make a point. This is aluminium. It's stronger than steel. Don't you think if somebody in the world had invented this, we'd be using it? Yeah. Mm. Because it's hardened this Smart. by a factor that you can't basically cut it. But when you put it in your hand, you can feel it's light. It's really aluminium, and it is. Now, the point is, and by the way, this is a piece of jewellery as well, this has stuff on it that we don't recognise today. This particular piece of work here, one of the ingredients of this is gallium. Now, I don't know if you know much about gallium, but it's not a, a, it's not a product you can dig out of the ground. It's a byproduct that you can only get at 3,000 degrees when you melt either iron or aluminium. Now, 3,000 mm. degrees Celsius, and then you get 0.1 or 0.2 of a percent. This has 6.89% gallium. It's the third largest input in this. And this is five to 10,000 years old. And you're telling me that five to 10,000 years ago, we were basically just starting to understand metal. Mm -hmm. Yet somehow or other, that process of getting gallium was found in 1879. Here it is in a ring. 
What that tells me is the whole of our story about the past is a fabricated lie, which is why the government appreciates our work so much. Oh, that's a nice <laughs> way to put it. <laughs> why they ring this? I mean, if I ring the if I ring National Parks and Wildlife. I get to talk to the head officer for New South Wales. It goes straight through there. <laughs> so I do get a, a ticket to the top. And um, the person who sent all these letters runs the department there and he's sent so many letters saying the same thing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm getting at is that what we're picking up in this country is science that can't fit in a country until 1788. No one came in but so-called primitive backfellers that knew nothing about the wheel, mm -hmm. didn't even have a bow and arrow. Mm -hmm. All they had was a stick with a point on it, and they called it a spear. And in Tasmania, that mob had forgotten how to make fire. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's one of the most intelligent things they ever did. <laughs> to forget how to make fire was the smartest thing a human being could do because what it did was it meant in Tasmania there were six tribes. If your fire stick went out, you went to another tribe to light your fire. You're going to start a war with them? You're going to start a war with those six tribes? If you can't, right, <laughs> you can't light a fire and your fire's out, you don't cook. Mm. You don't get warm unless you go to one of the other uh, tribes and say, can I share your fire? Can you give us some of your fire so we can start it again? Now, people put that down as a sign of ignorance. Whitefell has read it and said, oh, look, they forgot how to make fire. And their toolkit went down to six items only. In Armour Land, it's 128. They said, look how ignorant they've got. If they were so bloody ignorant, why was it in all the places in Australia, the ones that they had the most trouble defeating were the ones that couldn't make fire and mm -hmm. had six, mm -hmm. six objects they made, but they couldn't defeat them in warfare. They weren't ignorant. They 12 were stranded right. DNA. They, they yeah. maintain their 12-strand DNA. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. Can I ask you, um, just on the, that, that amazing, thank you for that amazing story, by the way, that part of history I've never heard told like that. So thank you. Um, can I ask, like, are, are there any reference points, say, to those, the visits from the Egyptians or the Phoenicians um, to giants <laughs> in your stories? Because that's, nice. that's oh, a yeah. very big ring that you just held up as yeah, well. Yeah, very big ring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, okay. I was and plus the bells. Do you hey, know, I'm... Campbell, did the bells that they confiscated had a metal in it that was not yeah, a Yeah, it was, exactly. That, I was thinking that. It had a particular type of yeah. Here's another ring. Basically, they can't. Look oh, at that wow. ring. See yeah, my right. finger? Yeah, yeah. Now, this yeah, weighs yeah, over no, 100 right. grams. You put this <laughs> yeah. on your finger, which I do, and no one else is allowed to. You put it on your finger, and the first thing it does fall around because it's weighted on the top. And secondly... Yeah. It doesn't sit on your finger. And thirdly, and people oh. said, I've got a fat finger, I can fit it in. I said, yeah, put it on for 10 minutes, mate, and your, ha your hand will get sore. It's and your hand so will heavy, get sore. yeah. Yes. We have giants. Oh, look, that's just, that's just <laughs> accepted. Look, we yeah. all, look. We know. There are little people in Australia. Mm. This is what we've yeah. got. We've got little people. Yes. We've got three the types. have disappeared. Yeah, I know the little people are still around. They're still around because I know they used to be actually well known. Like everyone knew that there were pygmies, but since the no, not pygmies. No, no, no. There's different types. You oh, look okay. at. I've got pictures, and I put it up on our website. We put it up a few times of the Berinians up in near Cairns, and there were 150 of them. That was taken in 1938. And Birdsall, Joseph Birdsall, is an archaeologist, five foot ten. The male of the tribe stood alongside him. His head was just above his hips. But if you took him away and you looked at that person, you would swear it was like us. His the, the body yeah. was exactly in the same configuration. Okay. It wasn't dwarf-like at all. It wasn't, wasn't like that. But there were two mm. other forms of little people, the hairy ones, which uh, we know about. Then you've got the small ones, the, like the fairy ones, which are smaller again. Yeah, then when the, you go to the bigger oh, ones, yeah, you've got yeah. the giants. Then you've got the yaois. Now, the yaois are not the giants. They're a different group again. And, yes, um, it is well known. In fact, there's not a black fella that knows old law that would dispute the fact that we have the Yowies, which stand, they're not really giants as such, are they? No, they're a bit taller than us. About but... seven, eight foot. Yeah. Don't have necks um, and sort of float in and out between the curtain. They come both sides. They show themselves when they want to be seen. Um, but, yeah, look. You've got to understand, we found that being I've shown you there 
in a, in a burial site, I have found a Neanderthal. I know it's a Neanderthal because it's got the square knob on the back, one and a half centimetre square knob, which only Neanderthals have. Another skull we've got, which was analysed by experts, we thought it was Denisovan, and it turned out to be an archaic Homo sapien. That's in Australia. You've got the no foreign people. You've got the three little people. You've got the robust individuals, the robust ones that have skull thicknesses of around two centimetres, whereas ours is about two millimetres, wow. ten times thicker. I've got one in our room, which is, what is it, 16? About 16, yeah. 16 thick, and it's a honeycomb skull. And my, what, you could put a Homo sapien skull inside it and swing it around. It's much bigger. And it's called archaic Homo sapien, which means our ancestors had bigger brains than us. And I've been trying to make the point for a long time now. Of the 16 hominids have been discovered, remember, last century there are only two, now there's 16, we're ranked seventh on skull size. And yet we call ourselves Homo sapiens sapiens. Sapien means wise, wise. Mm. Always look out when people insist something, keep repeating it. Over and over and over. They're lying. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, every type. What in Australia, if you listen to what the old people would tell you, my count is that there are at least seven, eight different types of hominids here, from little to massive. And we sit in the middle. We're not the smartest. We're not the dumbest, but we're not the smartest. You've got to understand that. Mm. Whether the Tartarian race was Denisovan, and remember, Denisovans have a far bigger brain than ours, or even Neanderthal, which has a bigger brain than Denisovans. Mind you, you've got to remember, we have got a much smaller brain than both Denisovans and Neanderthal, and the story is we wipe them out. <laughs> I wonder how. I mean, fair dinkum. My robust skull, if I hit that robust skull with my fist, I would break it. I mean, you can't break that skull, and they're brighter than us and bigger than us. Nothing about the past is real. Nothing. Mm -hmm. What I can tell you is that at one stage, all those other beings, all those other hominids disappear. Why? We didn't do it. I can tell you now, we weren't smart enough. We were nowhere near smart enough. Something happened. Some major cataclysms have taken place in the past. It could be that your Tartarian story relates to Denisovans. Mm. Because, because you've we... got to remember, Denisovans were making jewellery that you would wear today 70,000 years ago that was exquisite. Did you know Neanderthals had villages with hot water systems 40,000 years ago? You know what Homo sapiens were doing then? Not dribbling in caves. Mm -hmm. They were far more elegant and advanced than us. And it may well be because I've had elders tell me, oh, no, 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 those big people were still around then. So we don't know. We don't know whether the Tartarian things we're looking at were made by Denisovans. But remember, you've got to remember this and we have to accept it. We were never the smartest. Mm -hmm. And we are now picking up evidence. We've now found that Neanderthals matured quicker than sapiens. They, the young boys and girls became adults quicker than we did. Mm. And the fact you've seen the pictures of um, Neanderthals bent over like this, that was because the very first home um, Neanderthal ever found was called the old man, and he had severe crippling arthritis. So they decided all Homo sapiens bent over. I can tell you now they were as upright as us, and they were more intelligent than us, stronger than us, and we cowered in the background while they led the world. So I wouldn't be surprised if the reason why that's been wiped out is because it could be a Denisovan uh, creation because they surely, and the, the Neanderthals were making villages 40,000 years ago. We weren't. So who made this? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, but it's remember... A you are part Neanderthal. Mm. Uh, you've got other den um, genes inside you. I'm 4.7% Denisovan, which makes me 1 20th non -homo, homo sapiens sapien, which I'm pleased to announce. <laughs> I have no Smart problem man. with that. <laughs> I sort of look down on you sapiens and say, oh, you? <laughs> because honestly, I've looked around and I haven't seen, I've seen very little intelligence with homo mm. sapiens sapiens oh. for quite some time. Yeah, but I look back at the others in the past, 
And I'm going to use a quote from my elder, Kano, and he speaks about the fact that all these artifacts we have came from a time when we had more DNA. What he meant by that is we used it. We used our DNA. The junk DNA and all that. Junk. Kind of stuff. Yeah. If, if, look, honestly, <laughs> our brain works at 15%. If our liver or heart worked at 15%, we would be dead. dead. But we are dead. Brain dead. Brain because dead. <laughs> 85% of our brain is not functioning. What Kano is saying is the stuff you're talking about. These artifacts I'm holding up, which obviously belong to giants, this comes from a time when all of us, Neanderthal, Denisovan, Sapiens, had all their genes working. And you could just imagine what bliss would have taken place yeah. if all of our brain, the parts that are just sitting there, and we call it junk DNA, that's a lie. Mm. There's no other species on the planet. Nature doesn't make junk DNA. It's a contradiction. Nature makes for each being all that they need to live effectively. Absolutely. And it's interesting because there used to be a saying when I was a kid called bird brain, and it was an indication you were stupid. We've now put crows. In fact, there are scientists who call the crows feathered apes because they're as intelligent mm. as monkeys and chimps, in fact, more intelligent. But they have a tiny brain. But what people have never worked out is what if they used 100% of their brain, and we only use 15%. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and that's something we've mm -hmm. got to look at. You take the hobbits in Flores. Their brain size is the same as a chimpanzee, right, and about the same height too. But they had a language and they made tools. And then somebody originally, who was a Dean Fork, did some work on the hobbits, uh, the hobbits' brains in Flores and found something that the front of the brain was massively over, it was massive, far bigger than ours. The front of the brain, which is the cortex where all the major, major higher order thinking takes place, was swollen and massive. So they worked out this brain of 500 cc was probably working at 50%, mm. which means if it was working at 50%, that's 250, and we're working at 50, 15% at 1,300, it would have more brain working than us. And be brighter than us. So, all of our history is a lie. It's a lie. It's absolutely a lie. And I um, mean, if we look, so the thing that gets us always tripped with the Australian story is the buildings in the capital cities. Mm. Like, so I mean, I'm I, like when we talk about the Egyptians arriving, and I guess one that that force I guess we hear a lot in Tartaria is the Phoenicians. That would be probably oh the, the Phoenicians, the were Phoenicians. Them, honestly yeah. yeah well they're the boat people let's be yeah. honest about the boat that boat people yeah. yeah yeah exactly so um from our that would be they would therefore potentially be perceived as giants also so that's a, an interesting um look at the Phoenicians potentially but we still have these capital cities loaded with these beautiful innate buildings that don't line up with our history books and I'm so. I so am interested to hear the response to that from our Dreamtime stories. Like these aren't ruins. These aren't these aren't seventy thousand year old ruins. These aren't coming out of a catalyst. Like these are literally like a hundred meters from my door today is the exhibition center. Like they were literally fully functioning structures that we our whole all our cities are made up of here in Australia, and. Where did they come from and from where and by whom? So I don't know where that timeline is sitting now within our Indigenous and also that if we look at the truth of our history here in Australia, like we know everything we've been told you can scrap because it's complete lies. We know that. We know that we've been programmed through education, which is all education is. We know that the lunatics asylums were just giant programming you know, facilities, basically. We know that cathedrals and churches were basically power stations and that the, the, they used um, the frequencies of water and cymatics and sound, that those giant organs were presenting frequencies and harmonics that were healing and healthy to the realm but could also inversely be used in its opposite duality, I guess, which is where we potentially have these hotspots in Australia of negative frequency energy killing everything left over from that time but still we have these buildings and we cannot figure out who is responsible for them and how they got to Australia to 
day, like here in our current paradigm today, mm. not ruined. Yeah, you mentioned before about the city in, in the desert that was full mm. of, you know, the black fellas said it was full of white fellas. Do, do you know what, what kind of people they were? Were they Phoenicians, Egyptians, or, do, or were they just? Well, I can give you some dreaming stories. I'll give you a bit of a clue for that, mm. can't we? Yeah. Just Jennifer Isaac spoke about this. There is a, right. a very powerful myth. Myth. Yeah, it's an interesting word, myth. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It only means it's the truth. And when you yes. say it's got from 6.30 news, Inversion. you know it's a lie. Yep. Anyway, there's a myth, and actually it's been written about a lot of time, but no one's got proof of the fact that <clears throat> up in Arman Land, in that area, there were men and li- women that lived there and farmed, right, and they spoke about the fact they farmed, and they spoke about the fact that they liked the women. The women were nice and peaceful, but the men they didn't like as much. Uh, more warlike, and uh, a lot of people have looked for where they were, but the problem is no one can find it, but it's littered in the dreaming stories up in Arman Land of these people living there, and they go into great detail about their lifestyle, the clothes they wear, what the women were like, but the men weren't the same. They didn't trust them as much. They gave them the right to farm there. They said they were farming, but we don't do this sort of stuff. It is really specific. Mm. It's to the stage where, you know how like in um, when Plato spoke about Atlantis in um, Timius and Critias and in the other book there, they said, mm. oh, it's, it's an allegory. It's a metaphor for Greece, and which is funny because Plato and Socrates were obsessed by telling the truth. That's all they ever did. And there's no other allegory anywhere else. Well, this is the same thing. Because when you read um, Plato's account, they talk about the seven rings and in the, in, in, the, in the ring in the middle there, there's fresh water and everyone else is salt water. It went into that sort of detail about they farmed, the clothes they wore, the buildings they created. Um, and by the way, this was not the civilization that the people in Sydney were being aimed at. That's a different civilization again. This is what I've got to make the point. Mm. So, yes, are there stories indirectly of other civilizations here? In this case, yes, not only that, but the people that were in this, this, whatever this arrangement was, because we don't know, they were not from here. We guess from the description that they were probably from Asia. Okay, that's all we know for sure, don't we? Yeah. It sort of reads like that. I think it was something like sarongs or something, some sort of description like that. Yeah. It mm. gives us that impression. But what it also tells you is the original people were not adverse to other people because, like, talking about it, Phoenicia, you go up to northern, northern Queensland and there's Phoenician folk, or wharfs there, all sorts of stuff. We've been yeah, asked to go up a few times. Serena. Yep. They let them stay. But they And they said, if you want to live your lifestyle, because we know they were mining up at uh, that place we spoke about that got blown up. That was a mining place, mm-hmm. right? Okay. They let them do that. They said you can stay. So for there to be buildings that were made past that event is not an issue because the proof is in the pudding in the stories you've got from both in uh, with the convicts and up in Northern Territory that we will accept other people living here. And up at Serena, where the Phoenicians were there, and there are Phoenician um, religious symbols and stuff there which are very clearly belonging to them, they were allowed to live. But there was a rule. They had to live by the law of the land there, which meant there were a lot of things they couldn't do in their own, could do in their own country they couldn't do here. But those people who live there, they've come to the tribe that is stick, stone and bone, right? So they're not going to... And they did say that these people in the Northern Territory had buildings, but no description of the buildings, okay? So we don't know what they were. They could have been the same sort of things you're talking about in Sydney Mm. and Melbourne. We don't know for sure. Mm. And I don't know how huge that, I can tell you it was big because I got the impression from the the guys that were talking to me about this, that thing that they all saw in the desert, it's there. And why did they blow up Maralinga and stuff like that? Because I've got a strong feeling that was the area. Um, and therefore, no one can get in there now. It's very clever, isn't it? You can't go in there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that goes together. But we don't get more than that because you've got to remember, uh, stick, stone, bone technology, people that don't do technology at all, they're not going to take much interest in it and it won't become a major part of their dreaming stories. The only other dreaming story that gives you a strong indication 
that there was high level activity with um, high level technology is the only dreaming story in Australia that is found in every tribal region without exception. There's, because all our dreaming stories are region specific about how our tribe was made and how our land came together. But there is one story that belongs to every tribe. Now, do you know, have you heard of a place called Yukon Gorge that they blew up a couple of years in West Australia? No. It was a massive, uh, it's in West Australia. It was an Aboriginal site. It's the oldest inland site in Australia, 46,000 years. And uh, the mining activity. company that blew it up? Yeah, they blew it up. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Do you know why they blew it up? Because uh, it was full of traditional art and stuff, wasn't it? No, no, it, they did it for iron ore, but I can tell you why they blew it up, because four years before I was take, I was asked to go to the same tribe to fight for Ganga Maya, which was 42,000 years old, and we're going to blow that up, right? And when I was standing there, the elder told me, Eddie McPhee, I can use his name because he asked me to come, and I did that for him. He said, this one here, this is the story of one of the, the, the seven sisters from the Pleiades. This is one of the sisters. He said, but over there, there's one cave that belongs to all the seven sisters from the Pleiades. And that cave was called Duke and Gorge. They mm. blew it up. Yeah, they knew that. They knew. Mm -hmm. They'd been told yeah. that. They knew that was the, the Seven Sisters uh, cave, and they blew it up. Yeah. And what Eddie said to me, he said this, if they blew up Duke and Gorge, George, it's going to hurt our dreaming. If they blew up, uh, sorry, Ganga Maya, but if they blow up Duke and Gorge, our dreaming is dead. So the reason I'm mentioning that is because <clears throat> that story, of the seven sisters from the Pleiades coming to our country and landing on our country and standing on our country is in every story in Australia. And they came by what? Spaceship, mm -hmm. right? And I remember when I was given ceremony by the Ram and Jury, I had to go for a week to get this ceremony. It's not a normal one, believe me. And after it was given to me, one of the elders come up and said, how do you think we got around the world? I said, by boat. He said, what about the other way? He said, I'm not talking about that. I said, we're not going to UFOs, mate. We're not touching that at all. Of course, that's changed a lot since then. But they knew that. that notice what he was saying. What are the other ways we got around the world? Well, that's higher technology, isn't it? Mm. So, yes, it's known of old way by the keepers of old way, but not many today. But I've been given the right to give those stories, so it still mm. remains that way. So when we talk about phenomenal technology, well, if the Pleiadians are living here, you don't think we didn't pick that up and mm -hmm. learn from that? You don't think that was an inspiration to help us build things and create things? And that's what we're seeing around the world. Mm -hmm. They came here and every tri tribe in Australia will back up what I'm going to say. They are called the Seven Sisters from the Pleiades, not from Egypt, not from America and not from England. They're from the Pleiades. And Orion chased them. Now, the only part of the story changes is Orion, doesn't it, Evan? That's the only part. And what Orion does or doesn't do. Yeah. He can be a rapist, a spurned lover, something in between, and he can kidnap two of the sisters, then the main sister gets them back. There's little bits and pieces like that that change. But the general story of seven women, not men, coming to Australia and that's where the cross of genes comes from. And coming to Australia and staying in Australia, well, what are they going to do? What do women do? Often they make babies. And that's basically what I'm getting at here. The idea of modern technology in this country goes back to the beginning of the Seven Sisters because they came by spaceship and they stayed here. Well, what did they do when they stayed here? They imparted that knowledge. And it was a gift and a curse. And to begin with, it was taken as a gift, mm. and then later on it was seen as a curse. It's similar to the fallen angels almost, isn't it? You know, people bringing down technology that, that, but when you look at the technology that it was, it's like, oh, hang on, that might not have actually been that good for us. <laughs> ah, that's what we come across. That's what our <laughs> mob figured out. It took us a long time. I reckon it was a long, long time before we worked it out. But you've got to remember, Australia was not, it's not like the rest of the world because all of these other countries were allowed to visit, but they were never allowed to stay and they never 
they never made war on us because I was at that stage we had magic. Until the, the repeating rifle, mate, there's no way you can beat a black fella unless you've got a repeating ri rifle in their own country. And we had magic. We could sing you to death. And we had rocks. We could point at someone and put them down straight away. You can't fight a rock when they're used the wrong way or the right way, as the case may be. So we had all that stuff with us. And then we made the decision, we'll go spiritual and we'll leave that aside because once you get too... You've got to remember something about this country because this, this, this planet is evolving right now. In the next couple of years, it's going to evolve massively. Mm -hmm. And all the species on this planet, bar one, are welcome to stay. One is not humanity. Most of humanity will be banished from this planet in a couple of years because they're not welcome because we destroyed the planet. We have to fix it. And, of course, the ceremony at Uluru did fix it to an extent, but... I don't know who's going to be with us and who isn't. But that, that belief on the Pleiades, because the belief is that the seven sisters put some crystals inside Uluru, which then is the way the whole planet got healed. That's another technology that yeah. healed the whole of this planet with seven or some crystals that were placed inside a rock that healed the whole planet. That's the highest order technology you can have, planet healing technology. It's in this country. So to say that the original peoples didn't have technology is a lie. Mm. To say that the people in Australia had the technology and decided they didn't want it is the truth. So to have mm. remains of more advanced civilizations, whether it's Tartarian, Atlantean or Lemurian, is all the truth. And by the way, I have no doubt what you're talking about. I know I've looked at. My friend has shown me pictures of palaces in Moscow, in Russia, where there's no heating. There's yeah. not a fireplace. Yeah. Yeah. And the question you ask is, all right, we could get away with it in Byron Bay. We could yeah. get away yeah, without yeah, a yeah. fireplace. But I'm sorry, when you're, Minsk, when you're in Minsk, you need a fireplace mm. nine months of the year mm. and they didn't mm. have one. Mm. And you would have died mm. in those really cold buildings mm -hmm. in winter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you didn't have fire. You could not have lived. I get that. I know that's there. I don't know who the mob is that belongs to those buildings, um, but I do know there have been many earlier civilizations and nearly all of them have adopted technology and nearly all of them have been destroyed by that technology. I don't know about the Tartarian mob. I don't know how they were taken out or whether they were still around at the time. I'm not sure. But to tell me that you think you found buildings that were made before us, yeah, I've got skulls, I've got mm -hmm. metal, I've got yeah. objects here, and they're all from technology we can't make today. I mean, how do you put 6.89% gallium into a ring that's been broken three times and was found buried at Angkor Wat and has got to be at least 10, 12, 15,000 years old? How do you put gallium in there? Because, oh, there's cadmium in there. There's palladium in there. There's rhodenium in there. In fact, there are five IUMs, six IUMs in that ring I'm holding up now, and all of those objects, all those elements were found in the 1800s or past that point. Yep. How do you put them all in a ring? You yep. can't unless you've got technology at yeah. least the equal, if not better. Now, what's interesting about that ring I've held up is the coat on the outside, there is a cable inside it which is not attached to the coat. And it's 40.2% iron and 41.8% nobody knows. And that cable is inside. This is a coating on the outside. Yep. And you'll notice it's got two sort of UFOs on the top of it. <laughs> this is not a ring. This is a receiving device. Yep, yep. So that's the technology. If you said, I've got a, a receiving device looking like that, they'd look at you and say, how does it work? It's well, like a mobile know, phone. Because <laughs> you don't have that technology. You don't know how this works, yep. but they do. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We talk, We call it antiquotech. That's yeah. the word that we've been using, antiquotech. All this technology that we're finding from the yeah. um, ancient times, Campbell. Yeah, just, yeah, re well, recent technology. But this is when we look at, you know, the past and technology, it, you know, when you see what's going on, it, it seems that we started with high technology that was mm. like earth-based almost, I don't, you, know, you know, like talking like crystals and rocks and things that mm. aren't complex yeah. when you look at them, but they're, but they're 
much more powerful. And then we've just de-evolved or we've had someone mimic. or some ent- entities destroy the, yeah. the real stuff yeah. and yeah, mimic it into yeah. plastic, bloody, you know, crappy. And, and petrochemicals thing. and all of yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they Total were immersion. definitely using rocks. You've got to really understand something. Rocks are the skin of the planet. Mm. The earth is alive and the, the rocks are its skin. And you think the skin isn't alive, well, you're wrong because it is. Mm. So the rocks and the crystals, Atlantis, Atlantis and uh, Leah, who works with us, who's we've lost at the moment, mm. yeah, yeah. she's very much linked in with Hi, that. Leah. And she, oh, oh, hello. <laughs> oh, you are still with us. Okay, we weren't sure. Well, <laughs> Leah could probably talk more about that, but she was there when the destruction took place and it was mm. through crystals. It was through the misuse of crystals. Yep. But don't, don't forget this. Yes, they more, were more advanced. In some respects, but in other respects, they were just as ignorant as we are today. Don't think we're mm. that different. Well, and they, they destroyed themselves, and we're doing it in a different way. Mm. But here's the trick. The original people knew this, and that's why they walked away from it. And Australia was, like, I suppose to an extent, like a mecca for the world, a spiritual mecca for the world where people would visit. You know how you go to Mecca and you walk around that obelisk and then you walk away? It was the same here. They could come to the spiritual place and get some teaching, but then off you go, or if you're staying, over there. You stay over there. We're quarantining you. <laughs> you're in <laughs> lockdown. <laughs> oh, careful what we say. Is you. Okay, <laughs> we're putting you there. That's your spot, and you're allowed to go there and do what you want. But it was rigorous, and it was strict, and it was agreed to. And what happened is the more we lost religion and magic, then Australia changes from being a centre of wisdom to a backwater of primitive people that couldn't invent a, a bow and arrow, a wheel, an engine, and they had nothing but sticks and stones, and they thought, well, they're ignorant. But it was not so long before that this mm. was the only place that was running on a different, a different vibration, mm. a different um, mindset. Like a- Different radio bands, like a different yeah. resonance. Frequency. Yeah. Well, rocks frequency. and crystals were magic mm. then. Yeah. I mean, you know, the pointing of the bone. Yeah. It's rubbish. It could have been a crystal. It could have been a rock, and it normally was those things. And if you point it, I've got four, five killing rocks, and they can kill. Mm. If I was to use them to kill someone, and when we're being cursed, and I'm going to talk about this a lot in our next online conference, I'm going to talk about the time. We've been cursed so many times and nearly killed that on one occasion I got sick of it and I called my killing rocks into defence. And that was interesting, wasn't it, Evan? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we'll talk about I'm not going to talk about that today because we'll give away too much and yeah. we'll come to our conference. But I can tell you that in the past the rocks and crystals were as powerful as they were in Lemuria, in um, Atlantis, maybe in Tartaria, and they were used mainly for good, but sometimes not so. And we understood they had energy and power and, most importantly, magic. But, of course, once the magic goes out of society, then original people go down the pecking order as it goes out of society. When magic reappears, then our society will come back again. And we need that, not just for white fellas. We need it for our own people because we're having a problem in this too. (laughs) <laughs> Which is really interesting when we look at like actually what's happening today, this week here in Australia and the the parallels that have been drawn between this conversation today and what is actually taking place in our mainstream world. And we, you know, like this consciousness is blown up, um, but we've been locked down. Um, uh, you know, people have found their sovereignty and voice, but we've been masked. People are understanding the healing properties of their um of their own inner being and yet everyone's been um, forced these, you know, apple juice jabs. And we're in a really interesting situation. One of the conversations Campbell and I had last week was looking at Australia. We Obviously, I was present during the Uluru um, ceremonies and mm. looking at the energy and from this, the, the, the star-seeded community around the world, the energy that flew, flooded into Australia on that day. And the focus of it being the heart centre of the world, activating that grid line for all of the plane. Mm. And then we've got this like total um, Australia becoming like the prototype 
country of this um, rollout across the world right now of total, like all our freedoms gone, no sovereignty, total submission, please, all of that stuff. So I we talked last week about Australia actually being the centre of all of this. It is. Like it's, yeah. Ah, so yeah. It is, it's meant to be, and it was because of yeah. Uluru. Yeah. And you've got to remember, Leah has a guide um, called Mesref, which I regard in the same way I respect Kana. Um, and he made two comments about this. And I, I, I remember asking him twice. And the first time he wouldn't give an answer and I begged and got it the second time around. I said, give us some words of wisdom about how to cope. I don't want to use the word because we'll all get cut down. And he said one thing. He said, this is a gift. Mm. And people need to understand this. It's a gift. He said, if there's going to be a change, I mean, the hoppy call is the door and the hole, and they call it the fast-flowing river. The Mayans call it the two roads. Well, they're here. They've all said this. It's not just the original people are saying there's a change. And this is what's really important. I don't talk about the negativity of what's taking place today because I, we were telling people in our presentations five years ago mm. there would be a pandemic. We told them this was going to happen, and it would ramp up fear and hatred and division and, and make people distrust each other. And, I mean, and the situation we've got today is there are two paths available. One's about fear. One means that when I go outside the door, it, that virus could be in the air. Mm -hmm. That person walking near me might be carrying something that could kill me. Therefore, I fear that person. I won't touch that person. I fear the air I'm breathing. I fear the sun outside. I fear everything. They're doing this because in this time of change, and there's only a couple of years left, people, if they're going to stay on this planet, have to learn to conquer fear and never be fearful. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm in a situation where I'm hating that person who's doing this or I don't like that, and by the way, I want to make a point about this. This has got nothing to do with whether or not you do something with your arm. I'm talking to both groups. I'm talking to the group that say, if you don't do something, I hate you and I wish you were dead. And I'm talking to the other group that say, you people are absolute idiots. You're fools. You deserve to die because of what you're going to do to yourself. Mm -hmm. They are equally ignorant. It's this is not to do with medicine and this change. And some people have said to me, Oh, if you do this, then you don't. And I said, What are you talking about? I said, There are idiots right now that say they don't want to do something. And I don't like these people, but they're right about that. That doesn't mean they ascend because they get one thing right out of 500. What we have to learn right now, this is all about one thing it's about not dividing yourself, not hating someone else because you think they did or didn't do something. If somebody wants to do something, I don't care. We have a philosophy, which I've been talking about a lot, and I keep using this philosophy when this brings up. Our philosophy is the word whatever. If someone comes to me and says, I'm doing this and I've done that, I just think whatever. I don't care. That's, okay. That's your point. I'm not going to make a judgment mm -hmm. and I'm not going to react to it and I'm not going to give out anger, fear, resentment, mm -hmm. frustration. I'm just going to say, That's your journey. There's a lovely line in one of the prophecies we leave. We read a lot, and I think you probably know this, we read a lot of prophecies from overseas, particularly the hobby. And one of the lines that ever means a lot is the one that says, we are the ones we've been waiting for. And I think that's one of the most important lines I've ever seen. Because if you think you want to follow someone, you're on the wrong road. Yeah. <laughs> this is all about you yourself. And I do remember on um, one occasion, um, when we did the presentation at Uluru with um, Mick and Catherine Ann, which was on at the same time as what was happening at Uluru, a person that finished got up and put up their hand and said, look, most of my family think I'm an idiot. And most of my friends think I'm an idiot. How can I convince them that there's a change? How can I make them realise there's a change? And I said, you can't. I said, don't bother. Don't do it. I said, what you do is this. You do what blackfellas call seed dreaming. You tell them about this once. You tell them about where you're coming from once. And what I say to them, if they don't believe you, send them to our science because, as you know, we've got photographs of the rock exploding. We've got photographs of a UFO flying over there. We've got the graph of the Schumann resonance increasing 100-fold at 732. We've got lots of evidence of things that happen around the world. Say that, get them to look at that, and that will appease their rational mind. Now, what happens past that is, they might walk past that and say, I think it's all shit. Let them go. Let them go. 
down the line, that seed might sprout. It may take months to sprout, or we might have thrown it on concrete, which means it'll never sprout. But the point is, it's not your journey anymore. This is about each person on this planet deciding whether they want to live with the planet or against the planet. Mm. That's what it comes down to. Now, if you decide you want to live with live, live with the planet, then our Pachamama becomes the first consideration in every law and every statute and everything the world does. Yeah. Mother comes first, we come second. If you live under those rules, you're fine. And that's what it comes down to now. You have to make a decision about how you want to live. This, this business with the, the thing that's floating around and what you do or don't do is just side, it's just background noise for me, makes no difference. It's how you are as a person, how you react, how do you react to other people. And that's what this was about. <clears throat> Honestly, the, the cere ceremony that took place there, yeah, there were 15 to 20 million people around the world on yeah. that day at that time yeah. shooting their energy at that rock. And, yes, we filmed it at 7. <laughs> I can tell you exactly when the rock was turned on because we have the film of this massive white explosion of light that nobody saw, only the camera picked it up, that comes out of the rock and doesn't touch the rock, and it went around the world. That was the charge that changed the planet so it begins to heal itself from within. All the animals are comfortable. They will live in this higher vibration. But this is what it comes down to. The Earth at the moment now, the Schumann resonance now, a couple of times, isn't it, Evan? More than once. It's gone up at a level they can't measure anymore. Mm. And that's what we're feeling. There'll be a time in the future, it went there once for 28 hours straight, and the world went crazy, I can tell you. There'll be time in the future where it stays there forever and never drops down. And what that means is if your soul and your spirit's not accustomed to that, you will pass on. You can't live in it and you can't be born back into it because you failed kindergarten and now it's a university. Yeah. So what then happens And people say, oh, they go to hell. I said, oh, give me a break. I said, look, think about this. My take is around 80% of the people will go. How would you feel if you were the next one on the rank and you missed out? You were 80 point not 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 one percent and you missed out by that much. Does that mean that you go to the same place as Bill Gates and you get the same punishment? Yeah. That sucks. Yeah. No, what it means is that you go to a planet that's just like yeah. kindergarten here before it ascended. Yeah. And there you get your last lesson, man. The one word you said that put someone else in front of you was the last book person on the boat, and you're the first one off the boat. You can't be given the same punishment as someone from the cabal. It's just yeah. not going to happen that way. Mm -hmm. So what it really is about is the earth cleans itself of the humans that can't live here anymore, not that don't deserve to live here because old mate that just missed out, he was that or she was that close. Come on. That's pretty tough going because someone's going to have to be next in line at Mrs. out. Mm. And that group, must have been awful damn close. Well, let them go to another planet, deal with two more issues they've got to deal with, and then they incarnate back here. And remember, if it is it, reincarnation, which we know is true, mm -hmm. then it's not punishment. Yeah, It's oh, just that you, you went to school, you sat for the exam now, and let's be honest about this, and I'm, I'm going to be honest about it. Everyone I'm talking to, where the dross? We, we haven't evolved. We've had plenty of opportunities to go to the other side and evolve. <laughs> this is the whole point of it. And we didn't do it. We're all back here. Every one of us, we're in 7F, 7A and B are gone. We're at the bottom of the bottom of the list here. And you know what? Even now, we're in 7F. And even today, my last life, my last few lives, and a lot of my lives have been appalling. And I'm, I'm not a good chance of getting through. But the point is, if I don't, you can still come back here. There's no punishment to this. In fact, it's actually reward because if you come back here with a, the earth vibrating at that higher level, you'll be in agony. Mm. You will mm. not be able to cope with it. It will yeah. destroy you piece by piece. So what they're saying is we don't want that to happen to anyone, not even the cabal. We don't want them to suffer. Nobody should make anyone suffer. So therefore what the earth is saying is learn to live with me or move on. And the problem is that 
I know roughly within a couple of days when this changes, and I'm not going to throw it. I mean, I was I was desperately trying to tell everyone I'm not sure this thing's going to happen. And I know that our videos went around the world and I told everybody, I don't know if this is going to happen. I really don't think it is. Yeah. And I want to make a point about that. Those 15 to 20 million people took made a leap of faith and wanted it to happen and believed it would happen. Mm -hmm. They've got to do the same thing again because yeah. I can't give anyone, I've given people in our presentations and you've probably seen them, enough empirical evidence so they can say it's fake or maybe it isn't. It's not like a spaceship landing in front and seven aliens walking out inside and telling <laughs> something. We don't want that because everyone would say, yeah, I want to join the hippies and new ages now. I get it. I'm with them. <laughs> it can't be like that. And I love what we've got. Some people have said, this is amazing. Other people say, oh, it's all a load of shit. And I said, well, fine. That's fine by me. It doesn't make any difference to me, whatever. If that's what you want to take out of it, that's your road. It's not mine. Mm. So the moral in this story is that <clears throat> this planet, I thought it was unique. There was no other planet like it in the cosmos. I'm told there's two others. I'm told there's two other planets similar to ours. Let's make it nearly unique. It's one of three planets in the whole of the universe where this experiment has been carried out, where that everybody, every, be every type of being is here, is incarnate or is watching what's taking place here. They're all here and they're all here for one thing, the 21st of December, because we're either going to screw it up and the number, I knew exactly the number of people we had to have meditating. And I underestimated humanity because I never thought we'd get it. And we actually uh, did it by tenfold. It was tenfold more than what was expected. That's why that alien spaceship, which sort of hovered over Uluru at that time, was there to confirm or deny what was going to happen. And I'll guarantee you it left at exactly the same moment that rock exploded at 736. I'll check the timing on that, but I'm pretty sure it's the same thing. That was the big question, what would happen? Now, some people might think, where's the proof aliens have been here? And I'm, I'm sort of like, I know we've got to close soon, but I want people to think about this. If you want the proof to see whether aliens have been here, find a mirror. Look in that mirror and look at your face and then ask yourself three questions. Number one, <laughs> if I was a Labrador, what would I look like? <laughs> you look like a Labrador. If I was a zebra, what would I look like? You know exactly what you're going to look like. And then you go to every animal, insect, fish, bird on this planet, and they all look virtually the same. And then you look at one species here, only one. By the way, look at the monkeys, and they all look the same. Mm -hmm. Then you go and look at the other thing that came out of the monkeys, and there are 7 billion of them and they weigh from 40 kilos to 400 kilos. They stand from half a metre to two and a half metres. They eat anything. We all have different faces. No two faces are the same. Everyone looks majorly different to everyone else. Some people can run at 4Ks. Some can run at 40Ks, but all animals move at the same speed. Everything about humans, our genetics are mm. programmed for diversity, and every other species on the planet is programmed to conformity. Mm. What is the difference? The difference is we bred with aliens. And I just showed you one alien that doesn't have a forehead. Did you know they found a hominid in Israel? Is it Evan? Yep, no chin. No chin. Now, come on, no chin, no forehead. <laughs> this is not right. We're all, we're all supposed to come from the same mummy and daddy who are both monkeys, and they all have sagittal keels and we have sutures. No. No, no. Our genes are a combination of Tartarian, Atlantean, Lemurian, mm. alien. We are a mixing bowl of different mm. genes. Mm -hmm. And the whole purpose of this was to find out whether we could all learn to live together. This was what they were trying to do. Because believe it or not, out there, we found out out there, they're no different to us. They fight each other too. They're no different to us. We think that they're somewhere, some much far more evolved and more understanding. I remember asking them, well, they know more. They've got better technology. Surely they would understand the big picture and they'd mm. get it. No, it's no different. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are an experiment. 
And just like Hitchhiker's Guide to the <laughs> Galaxy, <laughs> there is no overlord that's going to destroy this planet. It's not like that, but the planet is going to change. And um, the, the answer is not, well, I don't know. It could be 42, couldn't it, Evan? It could be. <laughs> it could be We're never sure about that. But the major part of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy about this being one massive alien human experiment where we're going to find the meaning to life or maybe not the meaning to life, but something close to it. That's yeah. what this is about. The planet's ready to ascend. Um, it's a matter of where the humans are now. And at the moment, the majority won't. But mm. this, at the moment, what did Mesref call it? Was it brutal and ugly, didn't it? Yeah. Yep. He said the future, this is what the aliens are telling us, over the next couple of years will be brutal and ugly. And it has to be. If you want something that's precious, you have to earn it. It just can't be given to you. I thought it was going to be hard. I didn't know that they were that clever. It's harder than I thought it was going to be, incredibly hard on a daily basis. And um, we're in Ground Central. We're in the, the melting pot in Australia. Yeah. But remember this, it started in Australia, so therefore this has got to start in Australia too. Mm. Same thing. And they know that. And remember this also, ladies and gentlemen, for any people who think that the 21st of December last year wasn't important, can I remind you, it's on the 21st of December last year when the Pentagon made an amazing announcement. By our count, six hours after Uluru, and they said, we're going to investigate aliens and, and UFOs for the first time ever. And people kept wondering why. They know it's coming too. I know it's coming also. So, yeah, um, this is all part of a fascinating experiment that's been going on for an awful long time. And God, Douglas Adams, it's funny how sometimes, <laughs> sometimes can get part of the story. I mean, Star Wars is, is nearly, I, we've mm. been told Star Wars is very, very close to what happened out there. Yeah, yeah I've been told Star Wars was um, based on books from the Vaders, and that's how we get Darth Vader and Yo Yo. <laughs> what's his name? Yoda. Yoda. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, it's based on it's based on fact. I've been told that that's fairly strong uh, yeah, def, uh, description of what's happened. Yeah. And when it comes to Douglas Adams, that part's but that's about the Earth, and the fact. Yes, it is. I mean, they made a comedy out of it and added a few things around the edges to sort of make it more palatable. But the underlying theory of an event where there was a cutoff point, a day where, and basically what happened was they wiped everyone out. Well, it's not quite like that, but most will be. Not wiped out, just relocated. <laughs> relocated. It's <Failed. laughs> Yeah, it's then so interesting that. <laughs> that you bring up Douglas Adams because I actually think I um, randomly gave him one of his last interviews on planet Earth because I, I was 13, I was a kid, and um, he... He was doing a talk at our school as um, he's doing a literature festival. And I interviewed him for the school newspaper. And then the next day he actually died. So, oh, like, I actually, wow. I, I've always carried Douglas Adams and that, the, you know, this, the 42 and the whole very close to my heart because I was like, oh, my gosh. Was I well, remember the basically the underlying premise of what he said is nearly identical to what I'm saying. Yep, mm. absolutely. There is very little difference in this. Really, it isn't. And I mean, I don't know if he knew that. I mean, I do know Gene Roddenberry openly admits yes. that he was given the idea mm. for Dr. Spock mm. from them because that sums up quite well what they're like, the ones who are enlightened. They came to this earth for one thing, and it's to experience love because that's the one thing they couldn't learn properly. But everything else about Spock is very much a, a matter of what they're like. So yep. a lot of these science fiction shows, they're not coincidental. The ones that actually ring and resonate with society do so because there's an underlying truth, mm. the same way the Lord of the Rings yep. resonates. And I should know more than anyone else on this planet because we have those bloody rings. Yep. <laughs> and all they said about them what was written yeah mm -hmm. most of it's right it, yeah. they, they got one thing wrong but most of what the, um tolkien wrote was correct about that what adams wrote was correct also so sometimes does that mean does that mean the eye of sauron is actually here in australia <laughs> is that is that where the the eye of the tolkien's beast is 
No, actually, the, the, the ring that you're talking about I have, which is what they call the Ring of Mordor, um, I know it's going to sound like this comes out of the Lord of the Rings, but you ask Evan where it is and he won't know. No idea. I've hidden it. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, if I had a volcano, I would throw it in there because nobody can control it. I've had it on my finger longer than anyone else, and I'm damaged from it from good. I wear all the rings, and they've all worked their way into me in different ways. But that first ring... I'm going, when we do it next time we talk about the magic of the rings, I'll explain fully why that ring is too dangerous for anyone to touch. It, it's just uh -huh. beyond control. Now, I've got three rings from Atlantis. Um, I, I had one I gave my, the best of the three. I gave to two psychics and one of them vomited mm -hmm. and threw up for a week and her cat wouldn't go near her, nor would a rabbit. The other person who touched it went into the laundry and washed herself because the evil was all over it, and that is the least dangerous of the three of them. The third one, which I've never worn for more than five minutes, I will be wearing all night sooner, and I may not be come back after that. Those rings are incredibly dangerous, and he was right. If you've got to remember, Tolkien's story was based on a Swedish myth about three rings that ruled the world. And remember this, those rings... The first ring was buried at Hill End, one metre beneath the surface, one and a half metres beneath the surface. The third ring was buried at Hill End and found by someone else, four metres beneath the surface. And the second ring was found in a, a churchyard in Scotland, buried beneath the surface. And all of them were buried. Do you know why they were buried, don't you? Because they're too dangerous. Mm. But And also the Lemurian rings, and I just held up, one that's a Lemurian ring, and so is that one. And we've got others. Lemurian rings, they only tell you the truth. Mm. Atlantean rings <laughs> they lie through their teeth. <laughs> they really do. I mean, it's funny. When I got the second ring, the Atlantean ring, um, I got it, and both Evan and my wife, because we've seen so many artifacts come through here, we've got so many of them, they both said they wanted to put it on. And I was quite shocked because it never happened before. They both said the ring said they wanted to put them on. So I asked this ring. I asked it. Did they ask? It said, yeah. Did it say that? Yes. And I asked what would happen if they put it on. It said they both die. Then I asked the other ring, did you ask? Yeah. And what would happen if they put them on? Oh, I'd kill them both. It had no compunction. All three of the Atlantean rings have no compunction about killing because those rings were created in enlightenment and stayed and absorbed what happened after. And it finished in destruction. So the rings carry all of that story within them. One of them, the second one, I think we've broken through with that one. I think that one now, I can wear that all the time. It won't harm me. I think I can wear the third one. I've been told I can, but the second one, I could wear it and I did. I wore it a lot, but it's just not possible. And, yes, it does take over the, that thing about Smeagol. Um, yeah. It does that because one person at the beginning, and I'll tell more about the story later, one of the persons stole the first ring off me, stole it off me. And then I did things like put up on Facebook that she was going to kill Evan and I and told everyone they were going to kill us and did try to kill us, did try and kill us, and then lied and then deceived people and did some of the most horrible things this person's ever done, never done it before. It brought out the worst in everyone. And we had an occasion at one place where people were screaming at each other with a ring in the middle and a group of people walking back with a ring when they took it off me, saying to other people, how will we lie to me? We have to lie and deceive to this person and steal the ring off them. It brought out the worst in every person that's been near it. Mm. And it's uncontrollable. So Tolkien was right about that ring. <clears throat> Everyone doesn't know where it is, so if people grab him and try and find out, you can't find out. That'll be fine. And if they grab me, they can kill me. I don't care. I'm so old anyway. It doesn't matter. So I don't care about that. But that ring is all that it, Tolkien said it was. So these stories from the past that we adopt and we call them fiction are actually fact. Mm -hmm. And the stories from the, the present we have now that we come through the TV, awesome. they claim to be fact, but mm -hmm. they're nearly all fiction. Because we live in, in an fact, inversion. It's There's nothing version. now. I, well, I bought a TV program this week and I found there was an ABC show on 8 o'clock where Aaron Pedersen, this woman, go for a walk through the bush each week for half an hour. 
That's the only TV we can watch all week. There's nothing else there because if you watch it, it'll hurt you. Yeah. It'll hurt you. It'll hurt your head and you'll become negative and you'll become compliant and obedient and you won't think as much because they're trying to give you media now that makes your brain get smaller. Mm. And we can now prove, because we've got a homo sapien, archaic, man, it's 1,600 cc, we're 1,300. We're getting smaller. Our Absolutely. brain is shrinking. Yep. Absolutely. And by the way, I reckon within two generations, if they kept watching reality TV, it had dropped to 1,200. <laughs> it had just yeah. disappeared. It'd shrivel yeah, because nothing happens. If you don't exercise an organ, it doesn't yeah. grow. Yeah. Okay. I absolutely agree with you. Um, oh. You you know Helen, my partner, and we do carbonate and our things um, regenerative ag. And um, one of the scientific experiments that we've been observing is that the the poison that they've used on our food chain so subtly in such small increments, and which has killed the nutrition, has actually co- created a twenty one percent decrease in our hippocampus. So in mm. our forefrontal, imaginative, creative thinking faculties in our brain. So 21%, and that's just in the industrial era of food, poison, toxicity mm. levels. Oh, so it'll continue. It'll continue. Absolutely. All by design. All by mm. design. Yeah. If you want to have a slave population, you've got to make sure they don't question anything. And Which this is, is one yep. of the tests we're doing today. If, if people do what they're told all the time, then they're excellent. They're welcome. And if they don't, they're not. But that's a different story and we won't it's touch that. You'll end, <laughs> like, getting, you'll end up getting, if we yeah, use the I wrong know, words here, you'll, let, you'll end up being chucked out. We yeah. know, We're still we recovering. Know. We're still recovering after Uluru because we had about, uh, I think about 70, 80,000 people um, go to our website that month and more on Facebook and about 5,000 shares straight after. Our numbers went down to 100 yeah, 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 of course. Uh, and yeah. it's been like that ever since. And we only yeah. just broke through. We did an article about the rocks and we got shocked after four days that had done 50,000 people. And we realised why. Because the rocks don't seem to fit into anything and therefore it just got through the AI. Yeah, and we're the same with Tartaria. It's um, <laughs> a currently an uncensored topic. Yeah, because like it, the AI doesn't recognise it yep. into their, their, their frames of reference of what they've got. And we've worked <laughs> out now because what I'm now doing is I'm going I'm just putting up an article tomorrow on the rocks and I'm writing down, I was going to do 12 experiences where the rock shows magic and I'm going to do, I only got to do five, and I did 5,000 words, I had to stop. We're going to put that up. And that'll get through because it's about the rocks. And then I'm going to do another article doing more of the top 10. And then I'll do more of the magic again. So for man, the next four articles, I'm doing the rock. And therefore, we can get back to that number yeah. of 50, 80, 100,000 people we're getting before. Yeah, excellent. Well, uh, please tell, tell the audience everything about what's coming up for you guys and how they can connect in. Hang on, Evan. Evan? <laughs> <laughs> bring on, Evan. Bring on, Evan. Like <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the, the next conference uh, is coming up pretty soon. Um, so let's have a look here. In um, It'll be not this weekend, the weekend after. Um, and depending on what part of Australia you're in, if you're over on the East Coast. Um, 9 o'clock? 9, you yeah, 9 a.m. <laughs> if you're over in Perth, it's a little bit hairy for you at 6 a.m. Uh <laughs> Sorry America about that. <laughs> America is the day before. But good times. Yeah, in their afternoon. Yeah. Um, so that's not too bad. In the and U- Europe suffers. Europe, <laughs> I'm so sorry, no, does no, suffer. No, no, but yeah. the beauty of the system is that there's a um, replay. So you could, you know, if you're up having a midnight snack, you can watch a bit and then go back to bed and watch the rest later. They've got a month, haven't they? Yeah, they've got a month to rewatch it. Oh. Uh, so sorry about that, Europe and Britain. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, probably sorry, Western Australia, but you know, Australia's a big country with what three, four different time zones, so yeah, yep. can only sure. do so much under those conditions. So, how do people um get how do people get tickets, connect in? Uh, yep. yes, so go the to our alien ancestry.net, um. And then you'll see a link to the next chapter, which is, uh, I think we're up to 14 now. Um, <clears throat> so what we got here, it's, yeah, yeah, so it's $26 uh, Australian. 
um, which means if you live overseas, that's probably even better. Two cups of coffee. I've got um, a few different speakers um, with us on that one, so that's going to be good. We'll be doing a bit of legal stuff, a bit of UFO stuff. Evan, Evan, that was the worst plug ever, man. No, I <laughs> okay, so we've got Geraldine Grace, who is a New Earth lawyer. She's going to be covering a bit about, I mean, it, it's, uh, stop me if, because um, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm, this is all new territory for mm. me, so I, I'm really not sure 100% what she's going to say, but she's going to be basically covering, I think, uh, the new laws and um, social expectations of a I don't want to call it a utopian society, but a bit better than what we've got here mm-hmm. and what, what, we're, what we're expecting to have um, in the hopefully near future, something better and something brighter. Um, and also we'll be having uh, Diego Antolini from the X-Plan group. I'm not sure if people have heard of it yet. Um, it's an Italian research group that they cover. Um, they cover a whole bunch of different things. So it's going from like UFOs, ETs, interdimensional stuff, um, bizarre radi- uh, radiations emanating in odd places around the world. Um, he actually has photos as well that he'll be showcasing, which have not been publicized yet so we're going to be getting exclusive stuff for that so i'm really excited about it i've actually seen the slideshow he sent me the slideshow the other day and it is insane you know how the whole there's like this sort of um like th- this is like really really clear photos too um and it's always funny when people come up and they say like oh why do all these photos and videos are of of ets and ufos look very grainy very like you know it's it's a little too convenient that mm-hmm. they don't actually have you know nothing so well um Sorry to say this, fellas, but uh, Diego has <laughs> clear shit. <laughs> so it's really, really good. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's, yeah, I, I can't wait to see the discussions that are going to be had from that. Um, and uh, yeah, like also he'll be covering the development, uh, development, development, Hang on, I, have to, I can't remember the pronunciation. I'm going to butcher it. Sorry, Italian viewers, but Valmalenco Mountains, um, the area where they have like all the, the serpentine rocks underneath the the rock um <laughs> in the caves so it's uh, going to be very interesting there's some very bizarre occurrences there's a lot of activity mm-hmm. there um i remember some time ago uh, i was uh, he and i were talking about because he was doing a lot of research uh, more uh, his group's more recent research in that area um of the mountain um and he was asking me a bunch of questions to direct to my contact and the response was, well, there's actually interdimensional um, rifts that are popping in uh, that particular mm. area because there's some sort of, they, they called it the setting of space. Anyway, he'll be covering mm. all of that. Um, you know, if it's something, if it's your cup of tea, which I can't imagine it wouldn't be, mm. uh, you know, we're all into that. Um, yeah, go go check it out. Check out alienancestry.net. And um, yeah, just, you know, you'll, you'll see the whole thing on the landing page anyway. There's a lot of details and information there um yeah so there we go there's the link right there and um yeah yeah go check it out it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty stellar oh and then also obviously i'm gonna be there naturally at the very uh, obviously at the very end of the show (laughs) you know um the best for last (laughs) the best for last exactly like when like my makeup has like sweated off for the rest of the day and everything i'm just like i'm just like a disaster ugly mess as typical um but yeah yeah i'll I'll be um on there just um because what we're doing now like we're doing questions so um what steve and everyone um, uh, and I have, have been doing we've been uh, creating these questions so that I'm going to ask my contact Mesrith uh, he's already been mentioned so far um, he's my main ET contact he, he and you know we, we sometimes have conversations whenever I can get a hold of him he doesn't answer his cell phone these days I don't know what he's up to you know uh, poor reception I suppose in the astral planes I don't know but um, he uh, yeah I get responses from him and uh, I note it down and then you know we discuss the answers basically so go check it out full face of makeup (laughs) we can do it (laughs) well that just sounds amazing oh my god i'm so excited to connect you guys into this little audience that campbell has campbell's created a big audience i'm just on the sort of like tip of it at the moment but um it'll be so great to get these two um worlds talking communicating um so much overlapping and um Gosh, it's mm-hmm. been a total pleasure to communicate with you guys today. Like, thank you so much for the honor of your company and your presence and being able to have this sort of open dialogue with such, like, I just love being able to actually speak freely about everything that we want to talk about and everyone's capable of doing that. And it's amazing. And 
So thank you so much for me. Thank you, Kel. Pleasure. Yeah, thank pleasure. You. <laughs> no worries, guys. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Appreciate it. So Thanks, guys. We, we'll be putting this over our channels and I'll send you the recording and you can use it as you will if you want to and um, we'll let you know how it goes and I hope that you guys get a big hit from our audience for awesome. the, the conference coming up. So gratitude and honour, my friends. Thank you so much. Beautiful <laughs> and thank you and we will speak to you soon. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye. See you, guys. Bye. <laughs>